I mean, what's happening? This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we're back. We're back after that wild and crazy show that we did, which feels like a long time ago, but I guess it's, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's just a week ago. But that last show with Hilly Crystal's son, uh, Dana Crystal, was fucking wild, man. You know? Uh, greetings, Drew and friends from Troy, New York. Yo, Drew, Killer Biohazard show last night. We're going to talk about that in a minute. You know? We're going to talk about the Biohazard show in a minute. Um, yeah, that show, but yeah, that show was nuts, right? You know, it's crazy. Everybody love everybody. What's up, Chris? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, people love that show. <laughs> people like, we got to bring them back, you know? You know, geez. Meanwhile, he's like, he's just nonstop sending me messages, like, since the show. So, you know, it's crazy. But, uh, yeah. What else? Hey, John, what's happening? Uh, yeah. Feels like that, feels like that show was a long time ago. You know? It was a week ago. One, one week ago. Crazy, crazy shit, you know? Greetings from France. Cult of, mis, cult of misjudgment. Where in France are you, cult of misjudgment? Let me guess. You're in Lyon. Or is it Nice? I like Nice, France. Where in France are you, bro? Hey, Larry, how about that? We'll talk about that later, Larry. Larry was there last night. Um... England checking in. Go ahead, London. So, yeah. 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 Yo, you know that, bro. That show was awesome last week. Next week in San Diego. Yes, we are. Well, I'll see you in San Diego. Incendiary Device playing our first West Coast shows. Saturday, San Diego. Sunday, San Pedro. You know? So, there you go. Speaking of last night, and not and not in a uh, in a musical sense. <laughs> hey, speaking of last hey, night, everybody! Was... <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn, that was a great introduction. That walk of shame, boy! That walk of shame, boy! You really held it together. Let me tell you something. This is a walk of shame because anybody <laughs> that saw me last night knows that I'm still in the same clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let me bring Steven on as well. Hey, buddy. Hey. Hey. How you doing? Hey. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. Lori, Lori uh, is talking about la last night. Uh, she was at the, at the biohazard show, which was really fantastic. Yeah. I drove yeah. out from Cape Cod. Um, we had a crazy night. It was, it was explosive, man. That was great. That here was is great. a, here is a shot from last night. And uh, yeah. this was nice. taken by um, by Nick Nick uh, De, De, De Coco, I believe De Coco Co. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, Ralph Renna. Thank you for Ralph for sending this to me. But this was Biohazard last night at um, Albany uh, in Albany at the uh, Empire Live, and you know it, it was a lot of people there. It, it was a th it was it was it reminded me last night reminded me of some of the the the, the biohazard you know nine, 1994 in the in the, in in that era the heyday yo like you walk in the front door and the fuck there's a thousand people in the club yeah. there, was a, there was a thousand people there last yeah night. it was a packed yeah. out night yeah. great crowd everybody was really excited yeah. a lot of dancing it was really cool yeah yeah great opening bands um, and, you know, Biohazard, like, I now understand, you know, why, like, you know, those grateful, those crazy Grateful Dead people, like, follow the bands around. <laughs> I want to do that with Biohazard. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. you don't. No, you don't. But you, but well, you not say with them, but, like, in my own, my own vehicle kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. You're really opening up the Grateful Dead door to this guy. Slow your roll. <laughs> You know, I want to you know, be one of those weirdos that camps out and just goes to biohazard shows across the United States. I did that for a couple of years, you know. But I, but, but, I, but I was on the I was on I was on the payroll, so that was okay. <laughs> you know. So you know, um, um, oh, I got a picture for you. Check. Wait. 
check this one out. All right. This is the 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 title of this picture is uh like standing among giants. You ready? Standing among giants, right here. Oh, that, nice. That's um, oh wow. So I don't know what that blue thing is doing. Let me see if I can get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, this is standing among giants, and this is. On the left, that's Sal, um, who was in typo negative and life of agony. Next yeah. to him is Jason Bittner yeah. from Shadows yeah. Fall and Overkill and Stigmata. Yeah. Uh, next to me, uh, on the other side, is Matt Byrne from Hate Breed. And of course, on the end is the one, the only Danny Shula from Biohazard. That's four, that's four. It's all drummers. And that was some nice surprises, right? They jumped out and they did a couple of a couple of uh, songs. Yeah, yeah. They uh, funny you should bring that up. Um, I have a clip of that that I shot. Awesome. And and well, let's take a look at this clip. We'll, let's get through this. We're gonna we're gonna bring our guest on another drummer. So I thought this was a cool shot because the theme, the theme is like drummers, you know. Yep. So so there you have me and four drummers and and four really incredibly influential drummers i mean i was talking to sal and sat by the way sal is going to come on the show but you know sal played sal played on on bloody kisses you know mm -hmm. typo negative bloody kisses and 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 yeah it's kind of like the four horsemen you know sal played on bloody bloody kisses you know, jason bittner you know, it, 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 yeah it's great it's great <laughs> so that said yes they had a, they they had a bunch of they had a bunch of guests a bunch of those guys came on and played. And um, Matt Byrne got up with Biohazard and they did the very, the rarity, which is not in their set list, which arguably is my favorite Biohazard song. They played uh, Chamber Spins 3. Which oh, that's is, one of mine too. Oh, it just brings me back. It it bring, you know brings me back to those days with those guys, you know, like uh, those special days, you know, it's one of those, it's like when I hear disco or my, growing up in New York City, I hear Chamber Spins 3 reminds me of the, the days we, when we were just, we were so young and Biohazard, we were just, we were just doing it. Joe Ackerman in Tallahassee. Yeah. Bittner's, Bittner's a beast. Uh, okay. So yes, that, that, that's the introduction. Bittner's a beast. So Jason Bittner came up and I'm going to show this clip, but I want to tell you something about, I want to tell you about this, this clip. And it got me emotional this morning because, um, I I um I didn't notice it when I shot it when I when I shot it last night, but there's there's a part of the clip now I I I don't want to I don't know how to phrase this properly but um listen things are heated like biohazard guys are like they're like my loved ones like like they're like guys I grew up with they're like my camp friends it's like the biohazard guys and me it, it's like it's like I'm back in Camp Delaware it's like Michael Schwartz and uh, Freddie Goodman. And like, there's no mercy. And I'm working on this doc with these guys, and it gets it gets a little uh, gets a little heated sometimes. And you know, I don't want to say there was a problem, but there there was a little bit of a misunderstanding between me and Billy, and he was upset with me, and it was a it was a little awkward, and and you know, it was kind of fucked, and so. I didn't notice it until today, and 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 I and and I when I saw it, it got it, it choked me up because, and I and I made Rochelle watch it this morning. If you watch this clip in the middle of it, he looks me right in the camera and he goes, "I love you," and uh, it got me choked up. <laughs> so so here we go. Look 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 for that look look for that moment because it went it went past me at the time, but I saw it this morning and it fucked me up. So, so here you go. Let's see. Okay, our good friend from both Overkill and Shadows Fall, Jason Bittner on the fucking drum, but yo, you know, yo, Jay, this is like a hardcore metal David Letterman show. We're gonna bring up all the guests. And uh, we know that this is family time. Being that this is our backyard right here, 
We're gonna play a song for all the old school motherfuckers who've been supporting my allies since the 80s, since the 90s, since the old teens, so a couple of years, whatever the fuck. This is called DFL. Incredible. You know what? <laughs> I thought you know what he'll say? He go, that wasn't meant for you, he'll say. Yeah. <laughs> he'll go, that wasn't meant for you. That was for like yeah. That, he's good like that. He'll be like, that what are you talking about? I didn't say that. Like, what do you that wasn't meant for you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Dick. You know, like <laughs> sure. Yeah. We all know the truth now. That you know, no. he's that kind of a person. Yeah. It's like, you know, you, you, you you won't say it to your face, but you'll get that, you know? Yeah. But that was so. an incredible night. You saw some of the crowd and it was really cool. Yeah, right. Fuzz. Hey, good to see you last night, Fuzz. Fuzz said, I love your shoes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it, somebody thanked um somebody thanked Mike. Yeah. Hats yeah, off to Mike and big, the whole the whole staff at Empire Live. Yeah. You know, from everyone from like security to the bartenders, top notch people, really nice. Yeah. I like yeah, going right. there. I like, you know, I travel, I you know, three and a half hours out, it's always worth it. Yep. Hey Lori, uh what's going on here? Oh. Well, we got an art show coming up in May at Bridge Nine Records in Beverly. So uh, myself with Mike Gallo and um, Christopher Micken from um, Failed Imagineer. So we've got some cool graphic pop art and my ceramics going on on display May 4th. And I hope people will make it out. It's going to be a cool, fun day. And there'll be snackies. <laughs> Maybe snackies. You might have a, might get a free cookie or something. You don't know. Hey, Vinny Doak, what do you say, Stephen? What do you got going on? Uh, this is it, man. Looking forward to the walking tour tomorrow, you know? The, oh, um, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. By the way, tomorrow, here in La Ciudad de Nueva York, it is the Drew Stone Cinematic and Music Walking Tour. Um, a bunch of us are going out. It's free to all patrons. This is a fun thing. Um I used to do these things um, really, uh, how do I say that? Uh, it was part of my, my, my income, uh, but other, you know, pre-pandemic, but with this show and the films and everything else, I, I, I don't do them uh, like I, I used to, uh, but we're doing one tomorrow. Uh, if anybody would like to attend, if anyone's in New York City, we head out at 10 a.m., Reach out to me. We would love to have you. We're going to have some special, special guests tomorrow. Might even be one of the guys you just saw in that video. Mm. So, so yeah. So, yep. Yes, a Monday walking tour. Yes. Some special guests. <laughs> Might even be one of the guys you just saw in that video. So, we'll see. But, uh, but there you go. So, well, there you go. Yeah. Um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Let's let's bring our guests. Absolutely. Guest. Let's absolutely. Got, yeah, it's you gonna got be a good one today. You got that alarm shirt. You know what? Gotta love it. Gotta love what's it. Up with, what's up with your boy Mike? You know what? He's coming to coming to Sony Hall soon and um coming back to you know, they come every couple of years to America yeah. and uh looking forward to that. You know what? To some one of my all time favorite bands that became some of my dearest friends over the years yeah. and uh one of these days we'll get him on this show, God willing. So yeah, we got to get Mike on. Mike I'm going to put him in a headlock when he gets to New York. And uh... <laughs> hey, listen, we got Ian Mackay. We can do anything. It Sky doesn't limit. get old. It doesn't get old. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, take care. Take care. There you go. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comic. The Organic Grill, the uh, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, Mad Vintage, and the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm or boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. The client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famous Greg Rolay Ingo, Ingo Star. Dingo Star, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.texassilverrutch.com. Here we go. Clank your chains and count your chains. Let's bring our guest on. Let's clear the deck. What the heck? Make sure nobody's killing anybody in the in the chat room. Uh, everything seems okay. No interlopers. Nothing, nothing strange and bizarre going on. That said, today's guest is an American drummer hailing from Katona, New York. He's known for his work with the bands Crippled Youth, Bold, Youth of Today, Into Another, The New Rising Suns, Dead Heavens, God Fires Man, Bloody Social, Walking, walking Concert, what the fuck is going on outside my window? You know, I hate to say it, but when I'm doing a show, 
Like, if something happens, don't fucking call 911. I got a fucking show to do. That said, he's known for his work with the band's crippled youth, Bold, Youth of Today, Into Another, The New Rising Suns, Dead Heavens, God Fires Man, Ex Pollutants, and more. Please welcome, coming at us from Astoria, Queens, Mr. Drew Thomas. Hey, yes. man. What's up, my friend? Maybe they're heading your way. All that, that whole list of bands was just last week, too. So I'll right. figure something else for this one. Yeah, hey, you're like a proficient, proficient guy, man. Yeah. You've done a lot. Yeah. I had that uh, just when that was going on. I had the same thing out of mind. I was like, man, they, we time is perfect. They got sirens going on, the whole bit. New York. It's, it is. Yeah. You're, you, you, how long have you been in the story of Queens? Oh, my God, man. Like 1992. <laughs> so I've seen some changes out here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, look, my girlfriend's a couple blocks from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's so, a big so, yeah. popular neighborhood right now. Yeah. Do you ever do you ever um rehearse at Astoria Soundworks? Oh yeah. I love that place. Those are uh that's our boys, man. All yeah, out yeah. there. AJ and uh yep. Larry and yeah, yeah. You know, that whole crew. Yeah. Yeah, we we practice there too. There. Fantastic yeah. drummer. There's not not many places like that left in New York City. I right? know, man. It's true. I'm very happy they made it through COVID. Yeah. And uh, continue to to exist because that's a yeah for me that's just like a you know a spot I have to go to. So. Yeah, if we if we lost the story of Soundworks, I, I would be devastated. I know, right? Yeah. I was just talking about it the other day. I was yeah. saying like, to AJ, I was like, "Thank God you guys are here." But yeah, yeah man, yeah. holding on, holding on. Yeah, yeah. You know, for, for hopefully sure. we get Vitus back. Hopefully we get Vitus back too. Yeah, there's a lot of changes in the air, man, in the world. Yeah. Saint Vi Saint yeah. Vitus. Got yeah. shut down, see, seemingly over like a disgruntled person in the neighborhood. You yeah, know? Uh, I don't know, man. Yeah, these these neighborhoods they don't they don't want us anymore. <laughs> you know? Yeah, stupid. Anyway, so you know, uh, we're yeah. hoping for the best. You know, a absolutely. Yeah. So so let's uh, let's bounce let's bounce the ball around a little bit between you and me, and yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm 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 excited. I'm glad you're on the show. I've really enjoyed. Uh, a good part of your catalog, so I'm, oh, I'm looking forward you. to talking about that. And I, I, I mean that genuinely. Um, one of the joys of this show uh, has been, um, uh, I in doing my homework, you know, I, I, I'm exposed and, and I'm listening to a lot of stuff that, you know, didn't didn't really come into play heavily at the time. I knew peripherally, but you know, and then once in a while, it's like, wow, this is fucking great. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get, but we'll, we'll get to all that. Man. It's nice to, it's nice to talk to someone that, you know, that listens and, uh, yeah. you know, expose that. That's a good, that's, that always helps, man. Appreciate it. And two, it. two things in particular, and we'll get to that, but, but how did you come up? Did, did you grow up in a musical household? How, how did music come into your life? Um, yeah, for the most part, like I was always around a lot of good records and stuff like that. But, uh, for me, when I was younger, I was in a kind of a good central spot growing up a little north of the city and also near like uh, some areas in Connecticut. So I had a train line that I was able to take right down to New York City and also, you know, be, be close to Connecticut. A lot of different hubs for, for shows. And, um, you know, I just really was uh, kind of antisocial when I was younger. And so I kind of got lost in like doing uh, just drums and you know, it, it helped with a lot of anger issues. You know, I was just like, you know, one of those things where I was like, I, I need this for myself. What, so, what, what, um, was, what was the first music that you remember, like as a kid that kind of, what was the first music that came across your radar screen that, that, you know, affected you? The stuff that I, you know, for me early on was like, was like Judas Priest or Queen and stuff that was pretty like, just Heavy more, like, more rock and, you know, grand like seventies things. But rapidly like you know in the in the 80s i was you know immediately drawn towards like a lot of la punk a lot of english punk stuff i was in the black flag and uh yeah. sex pistols and all that stuff when it came out circle jerks and crucifix how, how does a kid in katona new york get exposed to that stuff it's interesting so <laughs> yeah i wasn't it, there for that long but while i was there i had like sort of the support system was was my with Matt Warnke, who is a singer for Bold, and right. uh, my buddy Tim, bass player. Like we had uh, uh, Zulu. Like we kind of like would hang out. We you know that was our little crew. Did, but, did uh, you guys go? Did you guys go to like 
elementary school together? Yeah, we we already we were together since elementary school. I mean, okay. we basically like we and me and Matt started going to uh, shows like really early, like in uh, eighth grade. So we would go to like the Anthrax when it was in Stanford, Connecticut, and sure. we became friends with um with Brian Sheridan and Sean Sheridan there, who were the right. owners and. You know, we were, it was kind of a novelty because we're like 13 years old, you know, and we're hanging out of this place. We gave him a cassette tape, you know, said, this is our band. You know, we, you know, what do you think? And he's like, let me listen to it, blah, blah, blah. And uh, actually, so so Brian and Sean get back to Matt and we're like, you know, we like you guys. This is kind of a cool thing. You know, you know, right, we right. like this homemade like punk rock band you're doing. So we put you on a show. And uh, it turns out, like, we, we find out what the show is, and it's Descendants. <laughs> wow. Like, go back. It was when they were doing the record, I Don't Want to Grow Up, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we were like, holy shit, okay. So, but it's weird, because we weren't thinking at the time, like, this is so, so I was excited to play more than I was to even, that it was a Descendants. Yeah. It was, you know, back then, it's like everyone helped each other. Shows weren't like that. It was kind of like all in the family. So we were yeah, just yeah. happy to be doing the show. So one of the big things about uh, playing that that Anthrax show was that it kind of changed the course of my life because most of the people that I met, because it was such a big show, a lot of people coming up from New York, people from Connecticut. So at that show, I met like Ray and, Ray and Priscilla from Youth of Today. I met Richie. Sure. Uh, you know, this is all before underdog even was happening i met like you know the cast of characters at that show that would you know define the rest of my like years for you know um for a very long time to come what what why um why drums what what what, what inspired you to pick up drums um probably because it just it felt like uh it was one of the only things that i i could do that i was not really proficient with, yeah. with uh with guitar and i also like didn't feel like you know i just felt like the physicality of it was what i wanted to do you know so it's yeah. like for me when i sat down on it it just felt i was like yes you know it's like it gives me a chance to channel all these fucking demons that i had and 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 it just felt like that was that was the instrument i tried guitar and i'm just like you know i mean it didn't really do it for me. So I just kind of knew when I sat down. What, what, um, when you first started, what other drummers, peers inspired you as far as like playing? Like, yeah, like who, like, like who, who, what other drummers inspired you? And then what other kids your age were sort of like, okay, he's doing it. I, yeah. I could, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I was thinking about that recently and it, it, I think there's a number of different genres of music, areas of music where I had my influences. It wasn't just one particular thing. I mean, I definitely grew up with a lot of like, enjoying a lot of like 60s drummers like Mitch Mitchell or, or Ginger Baker. I liked their creativity. Yeah. I liked, you know, some of these guys like Roger Taylor in the 70s. I, I really um, enjoyed like the people that could kind of bring a sort of artistic palette with the drums to, to like, uh, their band with a lot of groove, you know. So yeah, yeah. that kind of that kind of melting pot. I liked Clem Burke a lot from Blondie. I thought he Come was on a real, now. yeah, like super musical drummer who also was able to play, you know, uh, perfectly for the band and and still stay within the the framework of what they need. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, you know, Top, trying Topper, to develop Topper myself. Heaton. Topper yeah, Heaton. yeah, Topper is fantastic. I mean, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. Again, like yeah, you yeah. know, someone who I think I don't think he gets overlooked, but I think it's someone who has an incredible musicality yes. as a drummer. And yes. uh, to me, that's always been really important. I mean, you know, props for chops, but you know, I also think that to have the originality, the the, the artistic element with the drums is a big deal for me. Like, I, I think that that's something I've always tried to play for the songs, but also have, a, you know, enough of like, you know, have a, have a certain palette that goes with the drums that, you know, artistically that to work with, you know? What 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 kid what what kids your age like like who were your peers like when, when now now we're talking about we're talking about because uh, some somebody asked what band was this you're talking about we're talking about crippled youth right well yeah to start out um, so I was playing uh, I started playing like I said this the first show I did was um, back in like 1985 with the peers that I was with was like Matt and and Tim and and John Zuluaga from Bold. Uh, but that, yeah, this era was like crippled youth. This is probably like the anthrax uh, 
in like 1985, uh, I believe, like something like that. So we're just like, you well, know, you look, literally, I mean, I know it's true, but you yeah. look like kids. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're you're not teenagers. You look like <laughs> kids, bro. Yeah, man. We were we were I think that child we were probably like 13, 14 years old back then when we were doing this. And uh you know, that was pretty much like my 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 group. Uh, you know, we it was just like us kind of like on this island out there and uh we didn't realize until we met with uh we met John Perselli and and Ray Capo at, at the right. show that there were other people around that were kind of like, like-minded that live near us. Like, you know, John Priscilla didn't grow up that far away from us. Yeah. And, uh, it was like, once we found out like, Oh, we just, we just locked in, became brothers and youth of today and, and crippled youth became sort of like inseparable there for, for yeah. a couple of years, man. We took a lot of, of our understanding of, of what we wanted to do from being friends with them. And then, you know, put it in the grinder with what we wanted. And a lot of, you know, what we came out at that moment growing up uh, had a lot to do with our friendship between the two bands with Youth of Today yeah. and, and, and Crippled Youth and Bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing, that's a, like, that's a yeah. classic. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic. And that's a, that might be a couple years, a year or two later, but basically, yeah. basically it's, 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 it's uh, that's, the, that's the theme here. Yeah, that's and, a youth crew. Yes, that's that's the youth group, and uh, you know our our friend and, and drummer, uh, Chris Contos, who uh, was in Machine Head, he's in Forbidden now, and and Boneless One says, right yeah, on. he says musicality is the key to good drumming. Yeah, man, I I, I definitely that well put. You know, yeah. it's uh, you know, you can have a you know a metronome or a, or a loop going on. You know, you can still create a great song, but yeah. you know, when you've got a drummer who understands rhythm, stand understands musicality, and and also you know has the chops, like that's that's really what you know to me. Like I think what you want the key to it. Sure, I love I love uh, uh, Cody says Jesus. I was wearing a helmet riding up and down my street at that age. I was gonna, <laughs> I was going to say at that age I was still trying to figure out how to turn a doorknob to get myself out of the room. Uh, you it's know, a, it's amazing. At, at, at 12 years old. But, I, but. I guess like we were just so in it. Like, it, I guess I look back and I think, yeah, man, it must have been kind of a novelty to some degree. But but we were, we were just thinking almost with like adult head, like we wanted to play. We wanted to play as many clubs and, you know, yeah. just we were so driven because I wasn't like really happy or with the uh, surrounding environment that I was mm -hmm. in per se. And I just you know, I wanted to get out. I wanted to right explore. On. I wanted to play clubs. I wanted to travel and play drums and play music. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to, to be in a position where like started making inroads to that. Like after, you know, I met all these friends started, you know, it really became a kind of a click. So mm -hmm. from, from crippled youth, you know, uh, being friends with youth of today, um, when they were in need of a drummer, I was well, just, well, before, before yeah. we jump into youth of today, any recollections? Uh, this is this has become a bit of a uh, you know sort of an iconic record, and it's in, in its own precious in its own precious way. Could you give us any perspective on like this recording or how it came about? Who paid for this fucking thing, bunch of thirteen year old kids? I don't even remember who paid for it. It might have been right. like one of our parents or something. I remember my bass player Tim Brooks' uh, mom. I think drove us to Bridgeport, Connecticut to to do i think it was like downstairs studio we recorded with this guy i think his name was sam something and he was just like this older sort of almost like a like a, a social studies teacher or something and he's got it was one it was one of, we, we i love it we hear about that a lot on the show yeah. like, we went to the recording studio where a bunch of kids and the guy that recorded us never heard hardcore never, never you know, like no, nothing, nothing nothing it was yeah. great like like we'd be playing these songs uh you know, uh, like walk tall, walk straight, or 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 you know, positive yeah. scene, whatever we were doing. Yeah, 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 you know, there'd yeah. be like a minute or a minute, uh, ten seconds, a forty-five second song, and he pressed up. He's like, "Is that it? Is there any more?" <laughs> and I'm like, no, bro, there's not. Like he can't. We were so alien, but <laughs> we went in and one night and just knocked it out. I think we went back a second time to uh, do some vocals, and it was just like. You know, super bare. But well, we were so excited to get in. You know, and we're like, because we, I think we had already talked to uh, the independent uh, record label, this guy Mike Trishon, that was starting this label called New Beginning Records, and right. uh, so we knew. I think at that time, I'm pretty sure that we were going to put this out on something, or we wouldn't have done it. Mike was doing uh, this, 
And the other release that he was doing was called uh, True Blue at the time, which was eventually, which quickly turned to Underdog. And oh, so he did right. the Underdog. I, I, did, I, I did not know. I did not know that True Blue was their their first uh, uh, name. Yep. And uh, when that record came out, they had changed it to Underdog for that seven inch. So those two new beginning records were uh, with uh, Crippled Youth and, and Underdog. Um, gotcha. But yeah, it was it was a blast. But I remember a lot of the songs that we we did for that record originally. Before we met Youth of Today, a lot of them had a little bit more like different titles, like punk rock titles. We were a little bit more. Uh-huh. We, we weren't as like died in the wool kind of youth crew yet. We were just more like these like, you know, we had, I think we were, we just had these crazy sort of, uh, you know, like, you know, nutty punk rock titles. I, I can't remember too many of them, but, yeah. you know, we uh, we met those guys and we all of a sudden we were like, yeah, we, we kind of want to drive towards like, you know, something a, a little bit more focal, like to, for like the kind of common mentality for better or worse. I mean, there's times I think it, you know, would have been interesting to see if we didn't have you know, as such young kids, we didn't have an influence with all this and it went a different way, but you know, it, it is what it is. So we, we rewrote a lot of the songs, me and Matt lyrically to kind of I put see. in this mold, you know? So yeah, a lot yeah. of it became like, you know, United We Stand, Positive Scene, uh, you know, like I said, Walk Tall, Walk Straight, Choice, all this stuff. So yeah. we, we were really, you know, we were in it. And you well, know, so- well it, it, it's, it's, it was an exciting time. It was a youth movement. Yeah. Right. And and you guys were you guys were part of it. And you were you know, you were you were the power of inertia. You yeah. know, when, when you when you know uh, this photo here, uh, interestingly enough, is, is from a, a crippled youth show. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, that's Craig Satari. Right. On the right Over here is Craig Satari. I'm sure like for many people, he needs no introduction. Yep. We got Tommy Carroll right yep. next to him. Him and Craig were playing. Uh, Craig and Tommy were playing in uh, Mayhem together when, right. uh, at that time, when before they started playing for Youth of Today. And then there's John Priscilli, and that's that's Glynis, who was a, a New Haven girl, right there. Like so, it, it's you see like all the different uh, people it brings together. Like so I, I like this because it was really it was really a few hours ago I was hanging out with Craig Satari upstate. Oh, fantastic! So, just you know a, a grown a grown up version. Of, yeah, uh, of, yeah. Of, of I love playing with Craig, man. I had, a, uh, I had a good time playing with him. A cup, a couple. Now you, now we're gonna get, we're gonna get to that. Now I'm assuming, yeah. I'm, a, I just, I, but I'm assuming you, you played with Craig and Youth of Today when you went. Yeah, yeah, to, that was that year. So but before we go there, um, this, this one is a crippled youth shot from CBGB, and so you guys, at, at what point did you guys kind of? get a gig at CBGB and that must have been exciting coming down and playing CBs. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting because I, I mean, we were, we were thrilled. I think I, I played there uh, a show before I was in crippled youth there. I, I think I, the one, like I sent you a flyer for it actually with uh, it, I, I played there with a show with youth of today. And then we got uh started getting some shows, you know, it was always uh, super you know, exciting to go play there because the sound was amazing. And, you know, we had a lot of friends that we had made there. I think, I think we, we started playing there. Originally we had some shows set up like Warzone, mm-hmm. and uh, I remember playing there a bunch of them. Um, but yeah, the hardest part though, is that it's hard to get in because Louise was, yeah. <laughs> would never, would, I'd, I'd get kicked out like five times before I, I try to get, and finally she'd say yes, because I'm about to play, you know? So, but it was always the best time, man. The scene was amazing, and uh, the sound, forget it. You get on that stage back then, and it just sounds like the best club in the city. And here's a 19... I'm just going through some of these some of these great shots. Here's a 1987 from... Uh, this one's from the Anthrax. This is uh, a uh, another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 a Crippled Youth. And then yeah. one, one last one, which is Crippled Youth at Lupo's in 1986, Lupo's was in um, Providence, Island. right? Providence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was it. Providence, Rhode Island. Well, look, oh. you, 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 dudes were were doing it, man, at at, at yeah. a very young age. That post right there was a killer, man. People would have a a great time and a terrible time because people would jump off. <laughs> All that is probably blood on that fucking post right yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. We had Triple Youth played there a really cool show early on with Murphy's Law and uh, Dag Nasty's first show with Dave Smalley. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was like, a, yeah, there was some really cool shows there, man. I was probably that show actually was, was the first one we did there. Um, yeah. 
And uh, after that, yeah, we changed the name to Bull. But all that, all those photos were originally Crippled Youth before we changed. I, the name. I, I, meant, I meant to ask you. So, so we're we're, we're going kind of wherever the horse leads us. But yeah. why the name change to Bold? Uh, we were growing up from like, from thirteen year olds to fifteen and sixteen year olds. <laughs> so we were like, you know, uh, how let's try to do something that maybe we can live with for a longer time, you know, now that right. well, our voices are changing and uh, yeah. we're all going to be, before you know, we'll be 17. So let's change the name from Crippled Youth, which was <laughs> kind of novel for us at the time. But, uh, and then we were looking for something. I think we were on a, a, a tr early morning after a show, M like Metro North train with me and uh, Purcell and Matt, maybe uh, John Zuluaga. We were like, uh, throwing stuff around and maybe Purcell or Matt were just like, what about bold? And we're like, you know, at first we were like, it sounds like a laundry detergent, but then yeah. it kind of grew on us. You know, we had yeah. shit like that, like a breakfast cereal. Or, and this yeah, is before yeah. I feel like the name bold got caught up in every advertising campaign that's come our way in the last 20 years. Yeah. But uh, it was not back then. It was like, it kind of resonated with us. So we drew up the bar logo and we're like, yeah, let's, let's go with that. So there were some flyers like crippled youth is now bold. And I think, we yeah, yeah. Some yep. stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Is, is um, this sort of, as, as, as you were making the change, I, I know you were, uh, I guess, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll go this way with it. Um, you, you ended up playing on this record, which, you know, I, I, I didn't really put it together. I didn't, didn't realize that you played drums on this iconic record um it, it yeah so how did you end up playing drums on youth of today break down the walls um so like i i had mentioned we were you know just like at that time i feel we're all super good friends like family and uh i remember them kind of uh they they had originally been playing with a couple of guys that went off they all went off to, like to college but to the drummer and the bass player they didn't, I think, want to play anymore. So I remember uh, Ray and Purcell saying to me, "Yo, can you know, can you fill in for some shows and uh, help us out?" So I think, you know, I, I played up, I played some shows with them uh, early on in like '85 uh, in Albany and a lot of East Coast stuff. And then CBGBs was probably like my first show there was with AF and uh, AI, yeah, Agnostic Front had just come out, I think, with Eliminator. Mm -hmm. um, or it might've been just before that came out and, and Youth of Today opened up. So I kind of stuck with them because they, they were playing with other some other people here and there after I helped them out. I think they, they, they got uh, Tommy Carroll to play drums and Craig, they brought them in to fill a long-term position. And while they were out on tour, I think there was whatever schisms went on, um, yeah, you yeah. know, Tommy, Tommy left and they were kind of in a hole as far as like, you know, what are we going to, can you come back and play? So, um, Basically, I was playing with them. I did like some some sh more shows with them. Did like a, a tour with a lot of the records songs, um, right. probably in '85, the summer of '85. And I was there when uh, I remember them working a lot of a lot of the stuff. The shows we were playing, like songs like "One Family" and "Honesty." I remember those guys working together on that stuff and listening in and thinking about getting ideas for these things. And um, where they still didn't have a drummer in like the uh, in the fall, I think of I guess it was probably eighty five, and I yeah I said you know let's let's do it you know um, all of this by the way I <laughs> I laugh now but I think like they kind of had to twist my arm I kind of just wanted to be lazy and go skateboarding and eat pizza and fuck all you know and they're like yeah. no you can come out and do this and I'm very happy now that I that I did and got off my kid ass and was like go yeah. do this record you know I never thought yeah, that no, no, yeah. No, Paul Stone. Mike Judge does not play on Break Down the Walls. No, no. no. Mike, Mike played, uh, but Mike came in, I think, directly after I played yeah. with them. Because um, I remember that uh, I, the last show I think I had done with, I did with them was Richie's first show with Richie Birkenhead's first show with them, which is like a, a show at, in Philadelphia, some right. someplace in November of 85. So, and then Mike so came in. Did, did you, did, did, did you ever play in Youth of Today with Richie? One show, one show. Yeah, I was coming. In, he was coming in. I was going out. Um, so what's incredible? What's incredible here is as we're kind of going through it, yeah. the sort of moments of overlap. You right? know, like yeah. there's like all these incredible moments of overlap with you yeah. guys, with like 
you, you the, the youth crew guys, you know, you, Sammy, Wally, like all, all this sort of like, there's yeah. all this incredible overlap stuff with you guys. Yeah, it's interesting. I think about that myself. I'm, I'm you know, because me, me and Richie were friendly enough, but, uh, you know, he was hanging around with uh, the YOT guys. And I, you know, I, I think I was there maybe uh, when he was doing uh, some playing with them, maybe during Break Down the Walls, but I never did a show with them with Richie until that one show we did in Pennsylvania. And I was like, we all went together. Great show. I remember because I, I was in, I kind of got in a lot of trouble because I, 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 I was not home till like six or 7 a.m. in the morning. And I was like, you know, 15 years old. So I, I remember being, I remember I didn't call, there's no cell phones, you know? So I'm like, Ooh. my parents like, you can't do that. So they're like, if you're going to go do the show, you've got to get back at a certain time. And it was a crazy show. And Ray wanted, they wanted to keep playing, you know? So we're going like the second or third, I think second encore, going on the third encore at this show. I'm like, Ray's like, turns around. He's like, he's, I'm like, Ray, we got to get going, man. Like, I'm going to be in so much trouble. I don't, I keep coming home at seven in the morning. And Ray says in front of like the whole crowd, he's like, all right, everybody. Well, our drummer Drew's going to get back home to his parents. So this is like a fucking... <laughs> Like 500 people, like, well, shit. I was like, all right, let's this song, man. Let's, oh. play, let's get out of here. You're killing me. He put you, he, he as we, as, he, as, as we say, he threw you to the wolves. Really? Man, that was amazing. <laughs> I, it was, you know, that's, it, it was great, though. I had a really good time playing with those guys, man. That's great. Could, could you, yeah, and our friend, our friend Hoya, um, uh, one of the one of New York hardcore's most underrated drummers. He was Thank killing you. it within to another, and and we're, we're certainly going to get into that. What's yeah. up, Hoya? I hope you I hope you're well. Uh, you. Smoking Word podcast in the house. Fantastic. Um, any any recollections of of recording this? A, a, anything you can impart on us? Well, the thing that's I I was just talking about recently with my bass player Tim from Bold is that. Uh, we were talking about the fact that Break Down the Walls was done in the same studio as Bold Speak Out. Because um, huh. it's it's interesting because I feel like people listen to Break Down the Walls and like, you know, it, it's a cool sounding hardcore record. But I think Speak Out kind of got, uh, came out a lot differently. Let's put it that way. Um, and what happened was that the studio electric reels completely changed the live room in between the year in between wow. break down the walls and speak out so it, it was you know it was interesting to record there i remember they had a giant live room and you know i'm, I'm 14 years old by the time that this came out and 14. I'm thinking, yeah well when i was recording this i was 14 and i didn't you know i don't pay attention i wasn't paying attention to like the live room or the console or anything like that at the time but now in, in hindsight people ask well how come they're recorded in the same place and they sound so different well yeah. the studios changed it was really tiny tight space for break down the walls and speak out had a much bigger room but i also um recently we remastered uh speak out this last right. year and, and just re-released it and i think it sounds a million times better man the, the original mastering that that was done was 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 kind of a, a not a good mastering job for it so push for that when when in in remastering something like this do you did 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 you the did you, did you go back to the original source tapes we spent an incredibly long time waiting to remaster it because we were trying to find it and a lot of times jordan at revelation thought he got a handle on it but a lot of them were fake people were sending him fake shit right and uh, right, we i right. think eventually we just said like look you know I, yeah. I was real. I would kept. Pu I kept pushing for it. I'm like, let's just do it. Yeah. Let's get. You know, like I think we. I think we ended up remastering off the digital. But it. it they did a fantastic job with it. And um, I, I listened to it. and I was like, man, to me, I'm so much happier with this. I think sure. it's a much better presentation of what yeah. this record should have been. And you can really start hearing how, even though we were, were hanging out with with Youth of Today, and a lot of people were kind of putting us in the same vein that we were kind of pushing out away from them. I think yeah. it was a much different sort of hardcore we were going, we were starting to move towards with this record. Sure, and like Pat Baldwin says, whose decision was it to put the drum reverb on the instrumental track? That's a cool question, yeah. Um, for better or worse, it was my idea. I kind of already was kind of getting into the idea of, you know, even though it's hardcore, to try to bring some studio stuff into it. And, you know, just kind of hear like what, 
what I could do with my drumming in the framework of this. Um, and obviously as in the few years to come with Into Another and, and band, you know, stuff I was doing, or even the Bold EP after it, I was trying to push the boundaries, you know, with, with some of the stuff. And it just wasn't the most common thing for hardcore. So I kind of got excited about, let me try this and fuck it yeah. anyways, you know? So yeah. 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 I like this. This is back then. This is the, this is the bold speak out cassette yeah. on revelation, yeah. which, yeah. you know, if you know, then, you know, you know, yeah. It, it, yeah. I like they, those tints. Look at those yeah. tints. And I love, I love because you know when when they when they when they would go above and beyond the Call of Duty, you know, with the cassettes, and they would fold out and out and out and out. Like a you map, know? you couldn't put it back together. You just get pissed <laughs> off and leave it half hanging out. <laughs> I like um, this shot here. I, I like uh, this is like one of those. Well, this one kind of says says a lot. This is the the is this the bold van? Is this getting ready 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 to head out? Yeah, we call that the van of suffering, man. That was, <laughs> <laughs> we called the van of suffering, man. It was like it was a, it was just a hot box. Like we and like we had a loft that was right against the roof with a, a mattress in it. Usually, uh, we had our, our bass player Tim would stay up in there, just melting, so like dripping mud down off his feet on that. But it was it was scalding. We had no air conditioning. That like the windows barely worked, and we would drive that thing across country to go to shows and down to Florida. And, just oh yeah, yeah, just overheating constantly. We had like a cooler. I, ha I had one of these. This looks. I mean, this is a. Is this? This looks like a Ford Econo line. Yeah, had, that was I, Tom. Tom Capone from uh, Quicksand and yeah, and uh, Beyond. Where we bold after the Speak Out record, we we got Tom. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we kind of took Van of Suffering from uh, Bad Brains. For yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. But yeah, we got Tom to uh, join the band like soon after Speak Out, and that was his. Uh, I think his family van. Yeah, van suffering. I, I had one of those vans, very similar, and 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 you just brought back the memory of how hot the the, the ceiling would get. You know, yeah. driving in the summer, it, it's right. like a frying pan, and it's as you get close. as you get closer to it, it's like it, you you would like burn yourself if you touch yeah. the fucking yeah. God forbid you, your face touches that shit, man. You got no skin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good times, man. Well, so so uh, Tom Capone joined the band. Was it sort of we want a second guitar player? Or was it that era of like we want to like we want to go a little bit more metal? What, what, what was was what was a Tom and Tom, of course, being a, a a very talented guitar player. You know, what what was the thought of like let's bring Tom in? Yeah, it, it, it was pretty much the, the the era of like I think we could beef up our sound. Um and and we were like, let's try to get a second. It wasn't for the metal aspect of it. It was yeah, just yeah. more like for the weight of it, we were playing bigger shows and uh thought that it would be, you know, good to have a second just to kind of back our sound up. And then uh Matt saw Beyond and he's like, Man, this guy's great. Uh let's let's see if I can talk to him and get in touch with him. And so he responded to us and came down just for like a, a rehearsal, came up to Katona, it was out in Long Island at the time. And right. uh, he just played with me and Matt originally just to see how it was going. And I thought right off the cuff, I'm like, this guy is fantastic. And was it allowing me to bring a different sort of musicality to Bold for what he, having a guitar player like that. And uh, oh, you got the new kids on the block show shot here. Yeah, um, huh? Look. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> The right that's stuff. That's three, you right. That, that's that, right. That's the three, you right there. Yeah, that was. Well, that it's was kind, of a, it's kind of a great shot, bro. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Again, man, it's. Uh, we were just trying to go. Wow, like Tom's pose is pretty amazing on that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he brought a, a musicality to what we were doing that right away I recognized as giving me an opportunity for my drumming to push a little further. Right. And I took advantage of it. Again, for better or worse, depending on how, you know what you thought of what we did. Hardcore wise, like we kind of decided to, you know, become a little bit more, um, to push the envelope a little bit with being you know, uh, a little bit more free with um, experimenting with the music, you know, and, and, and doing things that weren't traditional kind of hardcore things, you know, yeah. just with uh, just with like, uh, I guess our presentation of it. And I I worked pretty much with him uh, on that on a, a bunch of that stuff and and then just and Matt I think it was uh, you know it was a it was a it was a little bit of a a rough time because I I think like 
not everybody in the band at that moment was was happy with necessarily the direction that we were going. Sure. And when it came out, um, the progressiveness of it, I think, put a lot of people off at first. And I'm amazed, mm -hmm. like these days, when I think of like some of the shows we've done a lot since then. Even like I came back to do some shows and watching people singing along to some of the things like Running Like Thieves or the yeah. other people I didn't think liked those songs because we only had that record out for a couple of months before the band broke up. It was our last wow. tour in '89. Uh, well, you, you know, through the magic of the internet, yeah. um, which yeah. I found out, you know, in singing with Antidote, you know, we didn't play for many, many, many years. Right. And, you know, we were, and we, we sort of got, uh, we, we, we agreed to do this A7 reunion show. And we got out there and the place was packed to the rafters and everyone knew every word. And it was like, how did this happen? Fantastic. You know, the, the magic of the internet Ooh, you know? in, in, in those, in those ensuing years. Right. It's like, yeah. It, yeah, it, it was incredible. Here's yeah. a cool shot. Um, I, I rec do I recognize Mark from MAD? It's a little, it's a, it's a little yeah. low res. Mark, Mark and Uta. Mark and Uta. Uta. So, so you guys got you guys got yeah. over to Europe early on? No, we didn't actually. Those guys were always traveling back and forth, and uh, so that uh, kneeling down is their good friend Stefan, who also worked with them. This could have been even before they had started MAD. I think they wow. might have just been travelers. Um, so Mark Uta and Stefan, and uh, yeah, they were fantastic, man. Like they were, uh, you know, always you know big uh, big help to us, and and good to see, good to be at the shows, and. That sort of transcended for us to into the into another days when um, MAD booked originally into another out there and helped us out. Yeah, gotcha. Also um, very close to Richie, so that's why too. So just just in, in sort of in in, in uh, oh, you know what I wanted to ask what we didn't touch on uh, the 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 crippled youth bold you know straight edge sort of movement scene. Right. Where did you fit in it? Where did you fit in on it? How did you personally feel about it? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, I, I I was very I was very into it at first in an act of rebellion against sure. where I was growing up and mm. the people around me. I didn't feel like I fit in like many like millions of us do uh, in in my environment in my high school. And I to me like. The, the way of my act of, of rebellion in that was like, fuck it, I'm not going to, I don't want to be like, these, I'm just going to be, I'm going to get into this straight edge mode. And, you know, it's, I think this is a common, sort of was a commonality for a lot of, a lot of people that probably had the same thoughts, but when it became kind of more of a sort of an elitist badge of honor and started to become this conformist situation, it was like everything that I had railed against, this yeah. has become. And I, I had to step away from it. Um, you know, I, I met, I, you know, and I, I was aware of like, you know, some, some intelligent people that I was around too that, that had opened my eyes to this to say like, you know, it's very easy to, to be sort of like straight edge and do, you know, have this lifestyle when you're not, you know, you're growing up in, in possibly like a more affluent environment and you don't have so many problems. But think about these people that you're putting down, man. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what these people's lives been like, and and uh, you know that was that was was very uh, uh, you know awful to me. And um, yep. I, I I appreciate straight edge. I appreciate you know people that aren't, and I kind of felt like I had to walk kind of a tightrope for a while in that because yeah. it wasn't like I was running out at that point, you know through. But there were also you know easy years. I was in you know I was in high school and and. Uh, you know, I was I was a very young person at the time. So, you, you know, it's, it's it's interesting what what just came up for me is like sort of, you know, in a youth movement like that, there's kind of like a mob mentality, right, you know, right. and, and well, like, you, you know what I'm saying? And it's like and, and I feel like and I can relate to that, you know, from when, you know, when I was a teenager running in Boston with the SSD control crew or whatever, whatever, right. you know, there's like this sort of mob mentality. I mean, I, I, I did a lot of kind of rude silly things as a teenager right. that yeah. that i don't look back on fondly but it's because i was you know i was running i was running you know i was part of the mob exactly you know? brother. it's like yeah. it's like kind of like a a wolf pack mentality and you don't even yeah. realize it sometimes man i remember being at shows and you know there's like some some somebody there who looks a little 
you know, fucked up and, you know, maybe got like long hair. And, you know, at the time, you know, we all were a bunch of like, you know, short hair, like, you know, all, all you know, suited up with our, <laughs> with our gear and shit. And we're like, you know, attacking this person in the pit. Like, you know, like I said, and it could go like, this person just trying to have a good time, man. You know, yeah. but again, sometimes that mentality gets to you. And I was realizing like, you know, we don't know who this is. So I kind of, you know, slowly like backed myself away from it and tried to be a little bit more understand. I could still be a dick, but <laughs> no, I get it. So what, like, so bold through the years, I know, I know you, um, you, you got, you got, uh, Revel when revelation did, uh, the 25th anniversary show. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you play those shows? Yes. Uh, that's when I started, I played with them again. I, I didn't, yeah. yeah, I didn't do the early 2000s shows with right. them. I thought it, it, it was the kind of thing where the, the rev situation, um, meant, means a lot to me. Um, Jordan Cooper and, and all the people that have worked there, man, they've really supported my career and a lot of the stuff that I've done throughout my life. So, um, just in terms of paying it back, I thought, it, you know, it would be a good moment to, to reconnect with bold and to try to, you know, play, play some shows. And they yeah, were yeah. They had a lot of fun, man. Uh, they were great. Yeah, they look, they look, they looked fantastic. Yeah. It was a good, that was a good reunion. That, that's one five. Hey, hey, you know, as we're sort of moving forward, there's one photo I didn't put up. I, I believe it's a crippled youth or photo. And I just love the sort of what's going on in the background. Like where are you, this looks like someone's like a friend, like where are you guys? Is this like a Vermont? Is this a, are you rehearsing in Vermont? Is this Connecticut? Where I'm, I'm intrigued what this is. Yeah, no, that's K-Town, man. That's Katona. Ah. Uh, we were up, that's a K-Town mosh crew scene. Um, yep. We were, um, we were upstairs. Matt had like kind of like a, a room upstairs that we were allowed to to jam out in. I guess it would call like a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were rehearsing at the lodge. You we were on the big budget, but yeah, uh, yeah we had all kept all the gear up there. I see. I had that my old drum kit with the stickers on it, and uh, uh, I I think I mentioned to you. I'm looking at that. Yeah. I wish I had that that cutoff man. That was like an old school Chromex like uh, flyer. It was like what it before they. I think that was that was given to Ray Capo, and he handed that down to me back in like '85. I wish so, I still had that. That was like big back then. Like I'm giving this to you, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Because they're not gonna pay me, so right. I'm not <laughs> gonna pay you. Know. I'm not gonna pay you, but I'm gonna give you this this you know Crow Mag shirt that, right. that, that yeah. Which is probably yeah. way like it is like payment <laughs> now, man. This thing I'll probably bring this around. I'm sure I could get some. Believe me, if you put that thing on eBay. There's some kid in Australia or Japan yeah. that'll that'll pay. You know, a, yeah. a, 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 and and case five in figures, point, bro. five yeah. figures for that. I guess. Well, well, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> what are the show sponsors? Um, uh, here we go. Um, yeah. Mad Vintage is yeah. is is he's a young guy. Um, started this thing as a teenager, and he deals with like all these old vintage hardcore T-shirts and stuff wow. like that. That's and he true. tells me, yo, it's outrageous. Like yeah. people pay people like without no no without blinking will pay five hundred dollars for for like an old you know thrash or 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 or, or hardcore t shirt. You Crazy, know? right? I wish yeah. I had my like collection of shorts. Yeah, but they I saw, but I yeah. all that shit up too, though. That's the thing. So none of that, none of them were mint. You know, I cut yeah. every shirt I ever yeah. had. I cut up. So I look yeah. at it like they probably wouldn't have sold them anyway. So <laughs> Sean McNally, I like that. A frame hardcore represent. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Right, I yeah. love it. Of course, yeah, he lied. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. So <clears throat> let me take a sponsor break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to get into, into another, Perfect. which I'm excited yeah. about, and we're going to get cool. into Dead Heavens. And, uh, oh, Ben O'Brien says, "Dad, Drew, your dad was my principal in middle school. Wow, he gave me an Into Another poster in eighth grade. Wow, fantastic. All right. Your well, dad was a school. You didn't mention that. Your dad wow, was a school man. principal? No, it's the it's the bad it's the rebel in me. I was like, ah, oh, principal. I can't talk about the principal. I can't. Oh, that's that's very cool. I remember I remember he was asking me for that. And okay, Ben, like now I know you were the you were the guy. See? You know, he gave me a, he gave me all this shit about playing music, and then he goes and hands out fucking posters. <laughs> there, there, there you go. Yeah, um, that's cool to let, know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, let's take a break. Um, I'm going to do some sponsor stuff and talk about some upcoming shows for a few minutes and we'll come back. We'll talk about into another and a bunch of other stuff. Okay. All right. There you go. It's the New York hardcore Chronicles live. Our guest today is drew Thomas. We're talking about crippled youth bold. We're going to get into another dead heavens. 
and a lot more. Lots to talk about. Let's hear from some of our sponsors. Peace. What it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. <laughs> We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it on. Oh! Will that be cash or in debt? Do you mean debit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Another eternal satisfying customer. <laughs> hey guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on the Third Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger. We have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do. And we are happy to see you guys. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections of music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Whoop. Whoop, there it is. Chocolate-covered electric jungle habitat. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Coming in hot after the big biohazard show last night. Very excited about doing the walking tour tomorrow. If you're in town, if you're a patron, even if, even if you're not a patron, feel free to reach out. Uh, we got a whole bunch of people coming out with us tomorrow. This is a very fun, fun time. I want to talk about a few upcoming shows. This Wednesday, yes, from conservative military image, Adam Voss will be on the show. This band is just blowing the fuck up. And uh, very excited to, to have the front man coming on the show this Wednesday. There will be a little lull in the action uh, after, <clears throat> after this Wednesday. Uh, next, uh, next weekend incendiary device we're playing out on the west coast so there will but there will not be a show uh, a week today on sunday um we're playing uh san diego uh both shows are with channel three uh saturday this saturday and then a week from today we are in uh san pedro so come see us play uh when i get back uh sunday march 17th paris mayu from Agros, of course, a guy I share a rich musical history with, will be on the show talking about their new skateboard fight music video. Sunday, March 24th, Mike Score from All Out War. Phil Poleo from Cop Shoot Cop. Swans, the children, and that's far enough on Sunday, March 31st. Bob Chapardi from Concrete Marketing on April 3rd. Cliff from The Freeze. We've been at, I've been after him for, for a couple years, so uh, looking forward to this. Talking about old school Boston hardcore and all that. That's Wednesday, April 10th. And then, of course, by popular demand, co-hosted by Howie Abrams, John Connolly from Nuclear Assault. Um, announcing this show uh, hasn't, hasn't gotten out there yet on social media. 
But uh, Joel, uh, Joel Gustin, uh, as in Boston, is, uh, is coming on. We got Sal and Dean from Electric Frankenstein, a band that he, he, he played in, uh, played drums in for a little bit. So uh, this should be interesting, all you Electric Frankenstein fans. This is going to be a pretty cool show. Uh, that, that said, yes, nuclear assault. Uh, th that said, uh, I want to thank everybody um, for supporting the show. Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate. Uh, people love the show. I love the show. And this show exists because of, of your support. And listen, nobody's getting fucking rich here. That's for sure. Um, but it's enough, it's enough to keep going. And I appreciate that. Uh, I want to shout out some new patrons, uh, Edward Kr Krasuski, Kitty, Christopher Park, Michael Boylan, and Ty Zembra. Yo, Ty, I just saw that, that you just, listen, that's the, the Patreon, the Patreon stuff is what keeps this show going. So thank you so much for supporting the show. There it is right there. You know, come join the fight. There's a $2 tier, a $5 tier. Um, you know, support those that support you. Uh, yes, Spikey. Thank you, buddy. Uh, is that right? You love Electric Frankenstein? Well, that's a show for you. And yes, Chris, Nuclear Assault. We, we, we are stoked on that. Um, so yeah, that's what's up. Um, there's a Patreon page. And, and I, appreciate, I appreciate those that have heeded the call because uh, the show still has great support and I am able to dedicate a lot of time uh, and energy into doing this because of your love and support. And, you know, last night and, and this weekend up in Albany, it was so great to see so many people uh, that love the show. It means a lot. It means a lot when I go out and, and people. I'm an, I said this, but I'm an accessible guy. If you see me, please feel free to reach out. You can reach out to me about anything. So I'm very accessible. Uh, that said, uh, there's there's a, a PayPal address there. Also, uh, on um, on social media, please follow the show uh, on Instagram, at Stone Films NYC. You can see it on the bottom there. And if you're watching this show in rerun, please take a moment to subscribe to the Stone Films NYC YouTube channel. Uh, and please, right now, give the show a thumbs up. I am told that. That's a good thing. I'm told by my by my son, my kid says, you, you need to tell people that. All right. Give the show a thumbs up. Like the show. You know, draw some attention to it. Uh, I know, right? Yo, it's like, yo, I'm up. I'm, I'm, I have been upstate like a lot lately between the awards show and Biohazard, staying in the same hotel, in the same venue, seeing a lot of old friends. You know, you know something funny. I, I, I didn't mention this. I didn't mention this. Uh, before when we were talking, but I saw some, there was there was there was a lot of really old school people at the show last night, like people that 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 like you know from the old Saratoga Winners days and and uh, the QE two, and Bob Riley from Murderers Row said to me, he goes, yeah, this is the kind of show up here where like guys that got like warrants out for their arrest, guys that are like fugitives. You know that are like living in the in the woods and like skinheads that have grown beards and long hair and are hiding out. They were at the show last night. It was like that kind of a party. Like people came out of the woodwork last night. It was fucking outrageous. So it it, it was it was that it was that that kind of a it was that kind of a party. But uh, that said, I think um, I think I covered everything. We'll talk about events. Uh, you know. Uh, on the net, on the net, yeah, survivalists. Everybody living in the woods in upstate New York came out to the show last night. So that's it. That said, let's bring our guest back on, Mr. Drew Thomas. Yes, hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah, man. All so, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was that kind of a party last night, bro. <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> yeah, like, down that, man. I like that. Yeah, out of the woods, literally. Yeah, like guys, you're like, Fantastic. wait a second. Isn't that, you know, isn't that like fucking oi, 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 Joe? Like, <laughs> looks like a mountain man now? Like, what yeah. the fuck? Exactly. Hey, Jorge, hey, what's up? Funny, right? It was true. Um, nice. Let's um, let's get into into another uh, uh, a little bit. Oh, real quick, that. though, Drew. Sorry, man, to interrupt. But uh, yeah. I was really liking your sponsors, man. Where are those? Where's that comic shop at, man? I'm a big comic collector. Yeah, yeah. Um, New, York yeah. Hardcore, New York Hardcore Comics is up in Dobbs Ferry, New York. Right, man. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of like, 
in the Katona uh, d- direction. Yeah, I know they're Dobbs Ferry. Dobbs- sure. Yeah, they're in Dobbs Ferry, New York. It's a great little town. Yeah. Um, they are my original sponsors of the show. That's and, uh, so cool, man. Yeah, Lee and Debo, they, they, from day one, they got on board and they've been here ever since. And Fantastic. You know, they do shows. Yeah, so please, if you get a chance, you know, let me know if you're ever heading up there. I'll, I'll give them a yeah, heads up. Yeah, I'll take a trip. I'll, I'm always I'll down meet you, I'll meet you up there. That's my um, shit. Yeah. Um, let me see. I'm just looking for some inf- Let's talk about this band, which was a really um, enjoyable, uh, you know, kind of quest for me. How did it, let's talk about Into Another. How did it come together? What was the impetus? Uh, me and Richie were kind of dissatisfied with the state of things uh, with in hardcore and, and like the just we kind of felt boxed in, I think, with what we were doing. And we both wanted musically to be able to escape from that framework and go further out, do whatever the fuck we wanted, but not to be held accountable to. I feel like we I was dissatisfied because every time I try to do something new with bold, it'd be like, oh, you know, you're you're not doing like the, the typical hardcore thing. And it was starting to get to me. So Richie was on board with that. And we were uh, we were tight through my high school years and decided let's start playing as soon as I get out of high school. Let's play together. So you know I graduated and moved down to the city and right away me and Richie did a demo did a couple of demos. Just and, just uh, just you and him initially? He played everything. He played the bass, wow. he played guitar and sang. I just did the drums. We sure. worked on the songs together. We did a three song demo at that place of Electric Reels, uh, that we had recorded those other records at Youth of Today and, and Bold. Um, and we were looking for some players. Uh, at the time, it was just like a revolving door that most people have, and we were trying yeah. to find people. And as a matter of fact, we actually had uh, Richie was friends with someone who brought uh, at the time uh, a Jeff Buckley in to see because apparently he wanted to play uh, and play guitar, but he ended up saying, "No, I'm gonna pass because I want to do my own thing." So that's funny. It's crazy, right? I know. That's I remember just sitting there. I, I, love, I love those moments in time. Like, yeah, we had, you know. Right? Duff we McKagan was in that. the band. Duff, you know, Moby was in the band for a show. You know. Like, yeah. Right. Like Those yeah, crossover yeah. moments we we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, Jeff yeah. going, "You know, guys, it's cool, but um, I think I'm just gonna do my own solo thing." So, yeah. uh, so, anyways, we, um, you know, just from Richie working at that time at the Pyramid, he knew, uh, he knew this this girl Catherine Ludwig, and said, "You know, my boyfriend's a really good guitar player. You should check him out." And through her, we hooked up with Peter Moses, just phenomenal guitar player and, and right. brother. And through him, his uh, he, he was friends with this girl who knew Tony Bono from Whiplash. So yeah, and, and t- Tony Bono, as as a lot of people watching the show, Tono, Tony Bono, Whiplash, the three Tonys, right? Yes, was, Tony, Tony, yeah, Tony, and, and Tony Scaglione, and yeah. yeah, Tony, 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 and Whip, Whiplash. Yeah, sure. Fantastic guys, fantastic yeah. musicians, and Tony uh, Tony Bono, rest oh, in peace. Yeah. Um, I love that guy. Um, and we kind of gel. Wow, t- t- talk about talk about synchronicity. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bono, my hi, Drew, Tommy. Tommy Bono here. Yeah, not oh, I'm that's not that fantastic. Much, I'm not much in touch as I am with Peter, Brian, uh, Reed, and Richie. But if you have any, if you have any into another media video, etc., of my brother Tony, I'd appreciate it. Wow, that's good. Just, you got it, just Tommy. as you said his name, yeah. that popped up. That's cool. Yeah, so, man. I, uh, I love, I would love we, you know, it's it, it's still to this day like, uh, um, saddens me because Tony was not only a brother but one of the greatest musical partners that I could have wanted as right a drummer. On. But uh, we'll, we'll, I'm gonna be in touch with Richie and Peter, you know, going forward. It looks like, you know, we'll talk about it later, but we might be doing some shows. And if I can come across any media with Tony, I'll, we'll, we'll see what we can track down, Tommy. Thank you. Is, is this the original sort of lineup of the band here? Yes. Yeah. That was probably uh, right before we did, uh, right between, right around Ignorus time, I think the third record. Uh, that's Richie, myself to the left of him, Tony in the back between us, and then uh, the right is Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it, 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 excuse me. I, I I believe this is is this at the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park? Yeah. It actually, I believe it is, man. We did a couple, like you know. Yeah. Every, yeah. No, yeah. But that, that. But I I, rec- I recognize it, and and uh, part of it because it, it it ties. Excuse me for the for the for the hard shill here, yeah. but it ties into the cinematic and music music tour there you uh, go. That's, happen- that's happening tomorrow right. because, because we shot the typo negative black number one video right yes. there at the, yeah. the fountain. And we'll be right. talking about that. 
But yeah, that, 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 crossovers. That, that's our theme today, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so, yeah we did also the, the i think the inside uh sleeve for the creepy ep the second thing ah. that we put out was also done around there so uh yeah man um yeah it's a good good location for sure as we both know yeah um so let me see i got i got a couple other couple other cool photos um but we uh what, what was this that i was a little what was this you you sent this to me was this sort of like our first prep? What, 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 what did this come from? What is this? Yeah. So I was just about to say, so that's Don Fury studio, man. Down oh, wow. Back on the, in the day. That's when we were first together, just fucking around and hanging out in the studio. So uh, quickly after we had got our first seven or eight songs together, Revelation uh, and Jordan Cooper said, you know, I, you know, interested in putting record out. So we, uh, we, Richie talked to Don and we thought it would be a good place for us. And it was, man. I had a great time recording at Don Fury Studio. Wow. It's still one and of and this is this is when the studio was down down. Yes. You had to go you had to go through the hatch, right? Yes, this is a Spring Street studio down through the hatch. Um our first promo picture was actually taken uh like coming up through that hatch that we had. I don't no, I, I should have sent that to you, but uh, yeah, man, it was uh, it was a really good session. We did uh, the the into an, first into another record there. We did like uh, seven or eight songs, and it was what I loved about it was Dom was a really um, really collaborative, really good to work with, and we were all hands on for that record. It was the old school, you know, recording to tape, and during the mixing, you know, there was so much that was. Uh, for us at the time, we wanted for, for the limited amount of production, there was so much invested in how we wanted it to sound. So during the mixing, we'd all have our hands on the board, working on stuff, making sure we didn't right. do these parts. And I think that the uh, production of it and working together was just such a, a good way for the band to start. It was a fantastic session. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just had to pull it from the archives just because it's just, here's the visual, kids. There you go. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. There's there's the visual. Don so much, Fier that much Don magic Fier happened down there back a lot, in the day. A, a, a lot of magic. And, you know, I had this – I forgot who gave this to me. It wasn't Don. Was it Don or was it Mike Judge? Or Somebody had this – they didn't have the photos, but they had a contact sheet or a piece of a contact sheet, and, and, okay. I, scanned, and I scanned it. And one of them was this, which, as I learned later, I don't know if you played the – these are the drums that – uh, I think Agnostic oh. Front did Victim in Pain, and, and they, th these are the drums that were in Dom Fury Studio. So I remember that kit because um, not I didn't use that for the Into Another record, but I had to do a show. I think it was Judge's first show. Um, they uh, were going to do a show at the Anthrax, and I they didn't have so for some reason they didn't they didn't have a drummer at that moment. So I got called right after I got out. Like I was at school, Purcell's like, "Yo." Can you come down and uh, help us out for this show? So <laughs> I went down to Don's. I played. I think I rehearsed on that kit, and we went out and played the first Judge show at the at the, at the, at the Anthrax that night. Yeah, that's, that that's, kid was cool. That, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you you hook up with Revelation. Uh, you put out the self titled uh, record. Uh, you you do creepy EP right, and then um and then you do uh ignate. How do you pronounce it? Ignatius. Ignatius. Ignorance, Ignorance, excuse me, yeah, yeah. and and that's sort of like the last uh, on revel, uh, the last one on Revelation. Right. Um, what leading into the uh, Hollywood records? Yeah. You guys end up on Hollywood. How did it? How did that come about? How did it? How did it end with uh, Revelation? Uh, why? Well, it it didn't really end with with Revelation. It's just we were, uh, you know, we we were kind of happy to go in and keep making records, but we had to, you know, be able to live like everybody else and try to, you know, have, have a little money besides, you know, living on for me, like at the time, like pea soup and cigarettes. Yeah. So um, we, uh, we were like the last, I think of the bands in our, in our, in that, that had gotten signed, Quicksand had gotten signed and right. Orange Night Millimeter and, you know, obviously right. like Helmet, all these guys got signed. So we had a, a, a decent following, but it just, every time we went to record labels, they it's like, we don't hear the singles. It was just too weird for all these late ladies. They didn't see anything cohesive sound wise with an image. And, you know, so we basically, uh, we took our live show, you know, around for, you know, good four years and built crowds. And then by the time, like after Ignorance had, had come out, 
um, we had a we had just such a good fan base. I think um, uh, David Walter had kicked off everything. He was an A and R guy for Mercury, and wow. he started getting generating some interest. And Hollywood Records kind of swooped down like the last minute and was like, "I don't want you guys signing with uh, with Mercury. You know, we, we we love you guys. Sign with us." And you know, they made us an offer we, <laughs> we couldn't refuse. So uh, you know, for for better or worse, um, the 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 record came out on Hollywood, but we had the vinyl on on Revelation still. This was which record? This this the Seamless that we had uh, was on Hollywood. Okay, so was it? Did you so did you sign like the full on full Monty deal with with uh, Hollywood? Yeah, 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 yeah. We signed the full Mickey Mouse Disney Disney yeah. deal. Hollywood and that, was and that, and that was for this record, which I want to talk about a bit, right? Correct, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the so, one. So that said, um, you recorded this record uh, for three weeks in Seattle, right? With, uh, with, with, with uh, yeah, I feel like we were out there for like a, a, a probably like a month uh, to a month and a half. Um, but it, or it might just feel like that. Um, but yes, we recorded with Rick Parasher. T tell us about this. Tell us about how he got involved and why you went with him as a producer. So basically we got into this deal and, and uh, you know, we, we had sort of had a clause where we could pick a producer, but the label had to agree to it. So we right. would go and do shows and we had like, you know, a and coming around to bringing producers. And for us, we were so used to doing our own thing. We were, you know, self-produced band. We really sure, enjoyed sure. The, the, that, that creativity. So uh, it was just kind of like, okay, who do we vibe with? And 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 Rick Parasha had done um, the the Temple of the Dog record and like Pearl Jam Ten and Blind Melon and stuff like that. So Hollywood and, and, and Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains, of course. He did Wood that song with them and yeah. a couple of things. And so you know he, the record label really wanted to go with someone like that at the time. And you know we we kind of were on the fence because obviously we were as a very indie band that is yeah. we got so many different edges to us we were kind of like all right is this good what's this going to be so we we ended up saying uh, uh, hanging out with rick and saying yes you know let's let's work together and he's you know he seemed like a great guy uh and he had a lot of cool ideas so we got in a van in the uh in the winter of uh 90 i think it was 95 and drove across country to seattle to uh record at london bridge studios for about a month and a half so, so you didn't fly you got in the van and drove <laughs> yeah and, uh, another van of suffering too van of suffering too right uh, yeah we had uh with the, you know just we were so used to getting uh on the road at that point we were touring probably like eight months or more out of the year so getting into a van and driving out to to Washington didn't really seem that crazy to us. Um, plus, we, you know, it was the kind of thing where we had some shows set up and all that to get us warmed up. But we got out there and started pre-production and it was a little difficult uh, in some hmm. aspects because, we're, like I said, again, we were so used to doing our own production and working on songs and our own structures to have like a producer come in and be like, take this out, take that out. You get, we started to worry about how that was going to affect our songs and the way Into Another sounded. And, and it transcended. And, and excuse me. And and yeah. and he was. Uh, I'm taking it was sort of like that type of producer that that that's that that got in with your songs and said, "Let's try it this way. Let's do it that way." Was he a guy that was like break, really breaking the songs down? He broke the songs down. I think as much as he was able to, without uh, with with us still being very resistant in a lot of ways with certain right. things. They got to some boiling points where, uh, for those anyone that out there familiar with. The seamless record, like songs like Locksmiths and Lawyers, he didn't want to be in the studio if we were going to record that song. He was like, I don't like that song. I don't want if you track it, you track it yourself, and I'm going to head out for the day. Wow. Now, that being said, wow. Rick was a, a great person. He's he's passed. He's, he's not around anymore. Right. Um, and uh, I don't I don't want to speak ill of him, but there were you know instances of of you know trying to record that record that I thought were fantastic, like his idea. To record may i which was all live in the room just we played that you know and then and then mixing it in uh in mono there are things like that so um i have good mo good memories but i have a lot of my feelings in general for that and that i wish we had been able to to make that record more of our record and less mm. this hollywood record but 
you know, we just found out that they somehow after 20 something years just yeah. re-released this on uh, Spotify and iTunes digi uh, digitally. And we had no clue. It was very, I, I mean, it was, it was buried. It was buried for years. You couldn't even hear it. Yeah. Yeah. It Which, was, it, yeah. This is, this is mind boggling to me coming in as somebody who, who, who sort of knew the band peripherally and right. I'm doing my homework and I'm, I'm listening to, I'm like, I'm like, this is fucking great. Like I'm really, I really enjoyed the into the another into another stuff. Um, really, really great stuff. And this record, I really enjoyed. And and I want I want to say like anybody out there that's a fan of uh, Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, Temple of the Dog, check out this record. Uh, there, there, there's there, there's a lineage there. You know, I I I, I you, you recorded it in that studio with that producer. You know, it definitely has. Uh, some some um, some of that flavor to it. Um, it it's there, there's what I, I made a note. Um, after birth, mm -hmm. after yeah. birth, very much sounds a little bit like okay. This is recorded by the guy that that uh, recorded uh, Al. Right? Am I right? Yeah, but I think that you know, uh, truth be told, I think that's one of the things that upset us the most that we didn't. Yeah, we right, were so far I'm, removed yeah. from that in uh, right. in our other records, and 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 when uh, we did this record, that was one of the things I think that we tried to steer away from. That Is that we, right? It makes it very difficult to get away from based on things like that. So I feel like you have half this record. It's like things yeah. like you date me or locksmiths and lawyers or the amphibian in love or you know. Um, songs like the way down like these are more the into another songs and then stuff that like that song afterbirth potentially hmm. like things like that kind of shifted more into the realm of what he was comfortable with so it was like I a tug that. of war sort of record and wow and it, you know that it was it was an interesting dynamic that being said i'm very happy it's been re-released i was just shocked because we had no idea that they were wow. putting this back up after all this time and I'm happy that it's not dead and buried, but I still have not gotten to the bottom of who decided to pull this out and start putting it up online. Yeah, and it's really timely, like I said. And, you know, I've been, I tell you, I've come back to this record and we'll get to some of the, some of the um, Dead Heaven stuff, but I've come back to, like, as a guy who's coming in sort of after the fact, right. I fucking love this record, man. It's, it, it, you, you know, and, and it's great. It, it's, it's always interesting. And, and I, I I've dealt with this too, you know, playing music when somebody kind of comes in, it doesn't know the history and doesn't know that who's just kind of coming in cold. It's right. like what, what certain people gravitate to, you know, yes. um, was That's it an, ex was it an exciting time for the band? Like, Hey, we're on Hollywood. You know, this might be our shot here. Yeah. I, I think it was in that we felt like maybe we can bring this further than we had previously only because, now we're being funded by something and we're right. able to like have more behind us, you know, just a, a larger thing behind us to have pushes ahead. Again, in hindsight, I think it was actually kind of detrimental because we already had a great fan base. We were already touring a ton and, and doing well sure. for ourselves. And in a lot of ways that I wasn't familiar with, because even at this time I was only 20 three years old, 24 years old. So wow. um, we, we, we didn't realize like, I think how much we were going to have to try to sell ourselves um, in ways that probably weren't the best for us. I mean, we, we, we were put on tour trying to do some, some shows with major label bands and there were some good tours. Like you know, there was a, I think behind me, I have a white zombie Ramones tour poster within to another, I think it was the last Ramones tour that wow. we played on. And you know, those kind of shows are fun, but still, not really. I feel like what we should have been doing at the time. Um, is is it is there? I mean, you you you've been involved with a lot of labels, a couple of major labels. It it, it must be a frustrating feeling when you kind of feel like we're kind of careening. We might be careening out of orbit here, and we right. we, we we can't. We you know the navigation. We don't have. We can't get the navigation system. That you know that yeah. must be sort yeah. of a scary feeling, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's. I don't think it's an uncommon feeling for yeah, most right. fans. I think when right. it does work, that's when it does work is actually uncommon. But yeah. for us, we had had such a good system, uh, yeah. and I, I feel we had a you know a good camaraderie um, in terms of us, uh, having done this ourselves for so long. That yes, exactly. When someone else is driving the plane, I think it got to be one of the things that was the the, the most detrimental and, and led to the breakdown of the band. 
and we mentioned the big, you know, the big machinery in place. Uh, you did a couple of videos, Mutate Me, right, with Fred Stern. Yes. Right. And and, yeah, and, and, right. and Fred Everett Stewart was hot shit then. He did green he green did he did green jello. Uh he did those those like uh groundbreaking uh tool, tool videos. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Totally. Again, Fred Stewart, another one that's passed. He uh I think yeah, it's been a while. Like he we did young, he was young. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, he really did, man. I was just looking at it recently. Like we did the mutate me video with him, which was fantastic seeing his setup. He had a full anim animatronic, like yeah, it's a cool uh, video. Like 30 feet of this crazy stuff that he worked out that he runs a camera through. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's just his setup. It was worth it to work with him, you know, uh, just, just for that kind of stuff alone. But yeah, uh, I think he passed in uh, the late 90s in a car accident. But he worked with some great people. Fred was was a fantastic director. Did did um and, and we're gonna, someone's asking uh about about uh about omens and, and we'll get to that in a second, but did 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 you feel like Hollywood in the end, Hollywood Hollywood records like they kind of didn't get us and we got put on a shelf and and, and got kind of like what was and, and was there was there a, was there a second record that was never released? Yes, all soul, soul control. So so before I get off the video thing, I, I just should in passing mentioned that we did do a, a few videos in, in the course of, of that our career with that starting from the first record that that were done really exceptionally well by our friend Noel Bogan right uh, I think the videos were as artistic I think yes tail and then um poison fingers one for splinters and I think that he sort of was able to capture like in his own artistry as a director what the actual music was sure. in, in that medium. So, you know, props to Noah for those videos and, and you can go find those uh, online as well on YouTube, I'm sure, um, or at the end to another website. But um, yeah, uh, as far as like um, the Hollywood situation, we did do one last record out in England at a time wow. that was really turbulent because the band was having trouble with the record label to the point where they were breaking down. Oof. I didn't feel like they were getting no one in the band really I don't know if anyone on the label thought that, they, that Hollywood at that point was getting the band seaweed was on the record label too they were having issue who um, seaweed there's a band seaweed. from uh, from from uh, Washington okay uh, kind of a little bit more in the punk world um, and uh, we were all kind of having trouble with it and then they started having like uh, infrastructure issues and we were kind of like put on a shelf just like okay let these guys sit there and we weren't getting paid they didn't know what to do with us we really just said we want to go back in and make another record and then the we got into some arguing with like the president of the label about it so we they just put us on hold and finally they totally switched the whole uh, lineup of, of who's president at the label, blah, 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 blah. And then we went in to record another record in England. Um, and I really wanted to go out to England because at the time I, I was, and even now much into electronic music. And I wanted to kind mm -hmm. of combine this sort of uh, progressive into another stuff with electronic uh, facets to it. And this was like 97. Yeah. So it was still okay. early on. It sounds like, wow, really? That's so, you know, ahead of its time, but, it, at that moment, it really there wasn't happening as much. So um, unfortunately, we went and did that record. Uh, we all spent a long time out there. Richie spent the most time out there. And we got back and they basically said, OK, you know, thanks for doing this. Fuck off and drop the band. Um, it, it, it's, it's really incredible. You, you, you hear about this from time to time. Major labels that go out, uh, swoop in, sign a band. And then they'll and then don't know how to fucking break the band. They don't they don't even know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. And absolutely. like and 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 the band and the band like you know is kind of you know left hung out to dry. It's incredible how many how many how many times that's happened. And and there's different variables. You know, a lot of times a band gets signed, the A and R guy leaves the label, and then they're like they got nobody. They, they they're rudderless at the label. You know, shit like that. Yeah, I mean, it happened. It's interesting because I kind of segueing into uh, I started a band with Garrett from Texas. Is the, is yeah, the reason thank you. Uh, called the New Rising Sons. And right. at that moment, at that juncture, it was really turbulent for me because um, I wasn't allowed to say that I was doing this band because everyone involved that was our management and the band, if it got around that I was doing this other band, Hollywood would have had a grounds to drop the band and not pay anyone out. Now, it didn't mean I was quitting into another, but I couldn't, I couldn't talk about this at all. So I'm sitting there in limbo trying to figure out what I'm going to do uh, with, with new rising suns. And 
So in, in a lot of ways, when the band got dropped, it liberated me to start doing this band, uh, which, is, which is me, Kevin McGinnis, Garrett Klon from Texas, The Reason, and Scotty Bestia from The Promise Ring. Um, and again, like we got, we, after a couple of years, we're able to, we scored a deal with Virgin Records to put this record out. And much like we just talked about, the label was had, uh, after completing this whole record um, up at Bearsville and, and picking out singles, the label was unable to carry the, the ball to the finish line and uh, to the end zone. And they ended up uh, dropping the band as well. Um, and, and they ended up signing you, yep. uh, g paying for a, a record, yes. uh, the whole bit, and then didn't have the ability to put the record out. It's incredible. Uh, and my friend, a good friend of mine, just uh, much like yourself, uh, started to um, do a documentary and just completed it recently. Um, yeah about this whole situation. And the, the, the documentary is called Endless Calls for Fame. And it's about the entire situation, the history of the band, how we started. And uh, she did a really, her name's Olivia Sowley. She did a fantastic job with this documentary. Yep, that's it. Um, if anyone's interested, you can find it at www.endlesscallsforfamemovie.com. And uh, I think she's, she's, uh, she's gonna have it shown in some places coming up and uh, it gives you, Without me having to regurgitate the whole thing, it gives you an overview of <laughs> the same shit we've just been talking about, bro. It's it's incredible, man. It, it, it's incredible, yeah. and uh, it's incredible how you know you, you as as a as a career musician like yourself, you know how you've navigated you know sort of these situations, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, almost uh, you know not all bad time but but you know an, an, again and again is another situation and some some work out and some end up being fucked you know yeah it's like it's like uh it's like the curse of 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 the of the bulldog tenaciousness of it it's like seeing a nail in a wall and going there and sticking your hand in it constantly yeah, <laughs> going right. i still got to keep i got to keep doing this and uh, right. it's fucking hurts but i'm going to keep doing it and that's you know yeah. it was the course of my life for quite some time so yeah well, wow. that nail. yeah and i and i enjoyed listening oh and and so um the the record you did for virgin was um was produced by Ted Nicely, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, Ted. Who, who for for those who may not know, you know Fagazi, Gr Girls Against Bo Boys. We just had John. We had Johnny Temple on the show. Oh, Johnny's great. Yeah, yeah, the Jawbox, and so that must have been exciting getting in in the room with him. Yeah, I really we we got along great with Ted, and and he was a producer situation that I feel like he uh, understood the music. Um, we got along really well. I had a great time recording that record up in Bearsville uh, studio. Oh, Bear, okay. We were right. in the main main uh, studio yep. while we were doing that and staying on site, and uh, that was that was a good one. And Ted actually, we had, we had a lot of issues with bass players, and, and Ted actually took over. I I played on that record, bass and drums. Ted played bass, hmm. and uh, it, he was he was a very solid player. You know, he's a good dude, and. Um, yeah, the record, uh, even though it wasn't released on Virgin, finally came out um, Ar Arctic, on Arctic Rodeo, right? Yeah, just yeah, the yeah. whole the whole record as it was. The original, um, we the the original cover, everything that was supposed to be is on Arctic Rodeo. Came out just before COVID, and uh, if you want to check it out. It's called Set It Right. It's and it's great. I you know I, I it's great. Like I said, you know, you know maybe it's because I had a whole week to do. I like I listened to your whole catalog, and you know th that was like that was that's a great that's a great record. And 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 in researching it, you know, Ar Arctic Road, they just seem really excited to be able to put out the record. They seem yeah. like they were yeah. super stoked on. You know, they they seem like really uh, just stoked to put it out, have the opportunity for this great record to finally see the light of day. Yeah, I feel like uh, Arctic Rodeo in a lot of ways is like the revelation of Germany. They helped out a lot of people in the same zone. They took care of a lot of my fellow bandmates and people that we've all kind of uh, had the ability to have stuff that had gotten lost in translation uh, put out by them in one way or another. And, you know, so kudos to those guys at Arctic. Yeah. So let's um, talk about this band, which is fucking great. Uh, this is Dead Heavens, and uh, how did this come about? And uh, you know, w w is, is it, and what's the mission statement? <laughs> yeah, right. It's great. It's the it's the crossover hour. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, it's it's not hard to see the crossover there uh, with me and Walter. We, you know, obviously known each other since you know we were very young, and uh, I had been playing with Walter in the early two thousands, uh, helping him out for a band called Walking Concert. Right. That was a bit of a departure for him, I think, from other stuff he had been doing. And then um, again with his solo stuff. Um, and I always, I, I love playing with Walter. It's, you know, uh, a, a great person to work with and yep. to bring out my creativity again and, and to write songs with. Um, so after walking concert and he got through doing some solo stuff, he was like, I, you know, you want to come down and work with me on some things. And eventually we just had a, got into a groove with this particular line of music um whatever he was workshopping we started to get into this thing that would become dead heavens and we were uh walter introduced me to this other guy nathan aguilar who was playing for this band cults and he's a fantastic bass player young um and i i you know a great friend we went out to a number of shows together the three of us and we started to uh me and nathan started to back walter up in europe and when we got back, uh, and Walter kind of wanted to. And, and excuse me, from what I understood, yeah. you did you go out as is the Walter Schreifel's band? Yeah, eventually, initially in Europe, I think we went on like one or two tours, just the three of us, and it was Walter Schreifel's band. And I think based on the way music was evolving um, and playing our own stuff, we were writing together, like Walter with me and Nathan. He wanted to experiment with getting away from just uh, being another uh, band under his name. So um, we, you know, I think it was his idea, whatever the, the name was. I love the name Dead Heavens. It was great, you know, very, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's very easy to picture. Um, and Nathan knew Paul Kastab because um, his manager uh, was that for cults was Paul, Paul was her partner. So Paul's, we just started recording down at his studio. I think you said, you know, Paul, yeah. um, he had a studio down in the basement of his house and little by little, he just started sitting in with us and was recording us. So everything we did again, much like the into another situation was self-produced, recorded, uh, mixed all of that ourselves with Paul engineering. And then, um, to me, it was it was what made some of these things unique because we didn't have to worry about a major label or anything like that. Are you are you are you happy with that? With you did, um, yeah. I like into another. Into another, I like. I love this band, man. This, this this is just fucking great. I mean, and I, I just want to say, everybody out there, I know, like uh, uh, Chico says, I haven't heard Dead Heavens yet. Yo, check this band out. Fans of Queens of the Stone Age or um, Caius, Old Black Sabbath, check this out. Really great. I, I kept coming back to this stuff again, Adderall Highway. Really, really great shit, man. Really, really Thank good, you. man. Thank I mean, it's really rare, you know, not, not to go on and on, but mm -hmm. people come through the show. And it's very rare that someone will come through the show. And even when they're gone, I'll go back and listen to their shit. You know what I mean? And this is one of this is one of those things, you know. Like this is, I rec I really recommend this to anybody out there uh, that 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 may have heard of Dead Heavens peripherally. The stuff is really really great, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, just looking at my notes, you know, started it started as the Walter Schreifels band, um, put out four seven inches in two years, yeah, and then uh, in 2017, whatever which you are on Dine Alone Records, correct, um, yeah, yeah, well. well how, Putting out uh, four seven inches uh, in, in two years was that sort of like a let's 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 go that route let's put out seven inches a little at a time let's get the stuff out there. Yeah, uh, well, we were really enjoying continuing to record as we progressed mm -hmm. and had the luxury of being able to do so or the liberty because we were going down to Paul's basement and just being able to be creative. And as the songs were coming out, uh, one of Nathan's friends had this indie record label in, in San Diego, which we were able to put the stuff out. So we did two like that. And then um, we had some friends come down to, you know, Lower East Side friends come to shows. Jesse Mallon came down to one of the shows and really dug it. He said he was doing a, uh, a, a an indie record label himself. And so one of the EPs was on his, his label, Velvet Elf. And then um, we just kept recording and, and obviously through, you know, Walter's friendship and connections with Dine Alone and, and our, 
you know, uh, wealth of material. We said we don't want to pull out a full length and they were willing to do it. So it was just kind of like, you know, leapfrogging one thing over the other. And I was happy to do it because in my, you know, I, I love working with Walter, but I, he's such his own hardest critic. So and able to get to get stuff out with him, I was so happy every time we get something out because I'm like, oh my God, I snuck this through. He did it. He, <laughs> <laughs> he got this out. It was fantastic, you know? Yeah. Um, I think I might have a couple of, of, of uh, sessions that will probably never see the light of day that I thought were pretty good that uh that we've done with dead heavens but you know it's just it, it it's another one of those things it was a great band maybe someday we play together but you know he he got incredibly busy man you know yeah well i think i think after you after sort of dead heavens they reformed uh quicksand again yes. and yep. you know you know you know wally kind of does the rounds you know it's it's just sure, like sure. quicksand tour to the youth of today thing to the you know yeah, and, and you know the world is better off. And then, is better yeah. off for hearing those bands, man. So I, 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 you know, I think it's it's his mission. I, you know, and and I love that band, but uh, you know, we're all on our, you know, if you've been a musician long enough, you're on your own mission. You know, you have to be able to pick up the pieces and and move to to the next thing. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and, and yeah. I hope you play again because I would really love to see. Thank you, Drew. Right on. I, I mean that, man. I, I don't, Appreciate you know, that. I mean that. Um, before before we uh, take a, a quick sponsor break and come back and take some questions from around the world, uh, we recently played together, uh, you and I, at, at St. Vitus before it was closed. Um, uh, me yeah. with Incendiary Dice Device and, and uh, you with Ex Pollutants, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Great show. You got it. Fantastic. Tell us about tell us about this band. This was this was a bit different. Uh, you see, you're doing a little something different here. Uh, tell us about this band. Yeah, um, X Pollutants. I, I, I really started to get the urge to get back and play some heavier stuff again. That you know, again, keeping sort of my aesthetic of having still some some weird ambient, crazy sounds in it, but but bringing in like people that wanted to do more hardcore related stuff. And I've been friends with my buddy Nick Miller out here in Astoria for a while, and we had talked about getting a band together. And Nick knew a couple of people, guitar player Kyle and Kyle in turn, his friend Ramsey, fantastic musicians. So uh, we um, we started recording much the same way Dead Heavens did. We just started writing songs and recording and um, we put a, a couple of things are out. We have two EPs that are out uh, under X Pollutants on uh, Spotify and iTunes, Bandcamp, YouTube, you can find it all. And we're in the process right now of working on a full length album with a fantastic engineer, Sasha Stroud, who plays for a bunch of stuff, but like uh, ADHD. And we're doing a show March 16th at Our Wicked Lady with um, Skull Shitter, Satanic Magic. Good place. And, uh, should, Good be place. A fun, should be a fun night. Yeah, yeah. It's, nice, it's nice to get back up on the ground up with some yeah. of this stuff. I really love <laughs> these guys. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's music I'm digging right now. So. And we got to get you down to one of our Bowery. You guys got to play one of our Bowery Electric shows. Absolutely, you know, one of the the all ages free Sunday matinees that we do. I think I think X Pollutants would be would be yes. perfect for it. You know. Yeah. Um, hey, let me take a quick sponsor break. Uh, this will be quicker than the last one, and we'll take some questions from around the world. Okay. Right. All right. That's right. New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is Drew Thomas, talking about lots, including into another, Dead Heavens, X Pollutants, Bold, and more. Get your questions together. Post them up. Don't be shy. Let them fly. Go deep. Get weird. Um, post up. You know, go, uh, go, go. Lou DeBella, what's up? Lou, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that. Lou, we'll touch on that one. We're, th that's a good question, Lou. Thank you. Uh, when he comes, hey, Marla, thank you. Port, Portland represent. Portland, Oregon represent. There you go. Hey, Marla. Um, that said, uh, talk about a couple. I mentioned uh, we're doing the walking tour tomorrow about five friggin' times. We're going out west. We're playing out west next weekend. Hey, uh, Incendiary Devices on the On the Streets Again 2 Fest here in New York. Uh, big shout out to Jorge uh, Rodriguez, who, who really uh, uh, swings the axe. Um, the first day is conservative military image and the take and a couple others. We are playing the second day, uh, March 16th. It is at the Meadows in Brooklyn. Uh, Sunday, April 7th, I will be moderating the Ray Capo from Punk to Bunk, from Punk to Monk book event at Generation Records. So come through. This is happening 
before the uh, Shelter Civ show at Bowery Ballroom later on. So come through Generation Records April 7th. And then uh, a bit later, I am doing it again up at Bridge Nine Records with Ray from Punk to Monk. Uh, that said, Sunday, April 21st at the Bowery Electric, free all-ages Sunday matinee. This one featuring Fahrenheit 451, Kings Never Die, Brick by Brick, The Car Bomb Parade, and Faded Lime. Uh, Lori mentioned the art show up at Bridge Nine on Saturday, May 4th. Saturday, May 25th, it is our annual Tompkins Square Park uh, Memorial Day weekend show. Uh, Rebelmatic Incendiary Device, it's going to jump off tonight. Non-Residents Cartel and Scott Helen's Guitar Me of One. Saturday, May 25th, holiday weekend. Bring that wife, bring that kid, let's go. Um, Rampage Fest 6, seven bands, two stages, Saturday, June 2nd at the Bowery Electric with Adrenaline OD headlining. And then we are about to announce this banger. It is the 50th Back to the New York Hardcore Root Show. This one's going to be Sunday, July 21st. Sworn Enemy, Incendiary Device, it's going to jump off tonight. Cropsy, Redwoods, featuring Colton Schuler, Danny Schuler from Biohazard Sun. This band rips. And Foul Pride. So this is an important one. Please come down. Support those that support you. Uh, that said, I think we covered pretty much everything else. Just a, a mention, I, uh, this Wednesday, Adam Voss uh, from Conservative Military Image on the show. Questions for our guests, please post them. Post them now. Post them now. Let's bring him back on. Here we go. From the Brotherhood of Drew's, Drew Thomas. <laughs> The crossover affair. Yeah. <laughs> yes. United and strong brotherhood. That's of right. Um, yes. Lou DiBella. Yeah. Uh, from Sub Zero, who yeah. I used to manage back in the day, oh, or man. or miss or miss. Yeah. You know, you know, when I managed bands back in the day, my, my business cards that we manage the unmanageable. Yeah, that, yeah. that that was it was I managed Sub Zero, Fury of Five, and Marauder. It Ooh. was like, yeah. Listen, if if you're in if you're a band that is out of control, insane, and likes beating people up, yep. I will manage you. Perfect. <laughs> That's it, right? There you go. Perfect. That's the card to have. So Lou says, uh, "Black in morning, one day Drew, one day before we die." Ha ha. Absolutely. What's up, Drew? Miss you. That's right, man. Me and Lou worked together. Uh, so funny, uh, funny story. So I I, I did a, a song with uh for for this called Zombie Slain Son of Scam, and uh, oh. And you know that you know that? so so well, I know I, I know Stan. To, to do this session and um, you know I did the song it, 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 with uh, Richie Kenna then went uh, out to do the they asked me to do the video so you know everyone was hanging out we had a fucking blast you know is like um, did you record at Richie's studio yeah I believe it yeah. was yeah. Um, and like you know the the then like the video was just like you know Lou was there Richie scammed Dust Isaac like and then I was playing with Richie was playing guitar I was playing drums and we did it at this bar it was a great day man it was so much fun but I really vibe with Lou and then um he had some stuff that he was working on with Rich and then I came down for it and I played drums on it and man I really love that stuff uh, the band we, we were calling it Black and Morning. And we had a we have a song called Max Luna that I, I was really digging. And me and Lou were always like, "Yo, we gotta do that shit." But you know, it's one of those things. It's hard to get everybody together. But uh, yeah, I agree. One day, buddy. One day. Yeah. Um, Darren asks, with everything that you've done over the years, Drew, is there anything that you would like to try out mu musically wise? Yeah, I think that. Um, I always would love to play more sort of like soul, like strip back, just real smooth grooves. Like, you know, um, that's one thing. It just takes a certain collective of people and it's just mm -hmm. usually out of my wheel. But I'm, I've always been a big fan of like of soul music, 70s soul. And, you know, it's it's one of those things that you I mean, you got to be good to do that. You got to yeah. be good to sit in a pocket like that. And I feel like it's something that I've just never really gone down that route. But yeah, man, like a, a sort of like 70s soul style would be something that I would love to do. Right on. Uh, Kenny Clark 
uh, who I'm going to see in San Diego, right? When, when, in a couple, uh, I guess next, this Saturday, Kenny, I'll see you when we play in San Diego. Um, how did you guys work around being in a band in school at 14 years old? Lots of tardy slips? Yeah, man. That's the best. They used to call me the substitute student. <laughs> That's they literally great. said that. I would go in yeah. there and get in trouble. They're like, oh, you're actually here today. Yeah, right. it was rough. I think I lived in a different time and I didn't get kicked out of school for like not showing up. So I was, it was a bad, it was a lucky time, man. But yeah, I had many tardy slips. Did, in those early, did, did all you guys go to the same school? So was it, was it just like those, those four guys are like, yeah. it was like, yeah. That, yeah, me, me and me and Matt had a had a, more of a pension to not show up, and we would not show up on the same days, and we call each other about it, like you showing up. <laughs> but, like, yeah, <laughs> we have, to, we have to coordinate this thing a little bit. Yeah, right? for real, it was, especially on right. a Monday after we'd be playing shows all weekend. We'd right, be like, right. "Oh, did you go yesterday?" I'm like, "No, nah, I, I didn't think you like. Nah, I didn't go either." But uh, right. no, Tim was really good. But uh, about it, I think he was he is did better than we did. But um, That's but yeah, funny. man, I used to fuck off a lot. Between the girl, between having a a, a girl like uh, that was down in the city and and playing shows on the weekends, like forget it, it was rough. Yep. but good. Um, you know, cult of misjudgment. You got just just hit me with three questions. Uh, but I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one because he he yeah. you know this has been mentioned omens. Can you touch on omens real quick? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, what about omens? So when uh, into another got back together to do in 2015, yeah, the the it was earlier, uh, I believe, because yeah. we did the Rev 25 uh, uh, show as well. Um, we didn't know if we'd ever be able to play again because Tony for us is basically irreplaceable. Sure. Um, but we found a couple of guys that you know seen. We got a musical video from them. This guy Brian Balchak who played in Ignite plays in Ignite and we yeah. black. And we were just blown away, me and Richie. And we'd been trying to reach out to Peter for the longest time, but we just couldn't find where he was. He like he disappeared. So we kind of like said, no, nah, we, we're not going to be able to play this, you know. But at the last minute, sort of Peter appeared out of like the ether and like was like, okay, wow. what's going on? So make a long story short with this, we ended up the five of us started playing together. The shows were going really well, and we're like, let's get in and try to work on some new music. And sure. when it, it we brought in different components. It was very sort of manufactured, like Frankenstein out from different things that we had to try to put this EP together. We went out to California and we recorded out there. Like, I think it was probably around 2014, 15. And uh, honestly, like for a band that hadn't played in a while, I feel like for our history, it, it, the music to me sounds like somewhere between Ignorus and Seamless. And mm. Omens, uh, I, I think is, is what is something that's one of my favorite band things that has happened from a band that cool. I was with a long time ago. I mean, and, and his other question was sort of segues favorite into another album. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I was thinking sometimes I think it's the first one that we did at Don Fury because I have such good memories of, of being there and, and doing yeah. that uh, starting out, but ignore us. I was listening to some of it uh, a little while ago and, and I was like, man, this is something about that record. That's a little pretty for me is, is kind of magical. So hmm. it's, it varies between the first one and ignore us. Sure. Uh, Jonathan Limos Zulaga. Yes. Uh, hey, Drew. Hey, hey, Drew. What's a bold OG guitarist, John uh, Zuluga, these days? Did he did he have Colombian roots? Okay, I get it. Yeah, that's yeah. I think that's uh, that's our original guitar player, John. Got it. Got yeah, it. Zulu, yeah, and yes, all the questions are yes. I, I, what is he doing these days? I don't know. We should catch up soon. Yeah, there you go. You got me. Yep. Um, oh, Chris Contos, thank you, buddy. What would you tell young bands about the about the band lifestyle and the level of commitment it takes to actually make it happen? Seems that so many kids think you can just devote such a limited amount of time to it these days. Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much uh, I think a product of our culture right now because everything yeah. is so instant. You can find anything you want back, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, unless you're willing to really just sort of go crazy and, and devote your life to something in a maniacal way and and <laughs> lose out on, you know, a normal sort of like a, a normal, any semblance of a normal existence, then, you know, you it, to get someplace, 
you can do it. But I don't think that most people realize the heartbreak and the hat. Like there's, there, you know, there, it's a seesaw. You know, you have incredible, incredible moments of like, this is the best thing I could ever do. And then like, what the fuck did I do this for? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think that it's a much different time culturally now. So I don't, I don't think that people can understand really like the, like playing eight months out of a year, just starting and playing or playing shows where a new band that's 13 years old can open for the descendants. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was kind of a, a unique time. And yeah. um, I think I would say if you, you know, if you want to do something for fun, do it. But I never expected any of the stuff that I ever did when I was younger would be considered something that would still be around right now. I had no idea that a bold speak out or a break down the walls or an ignore us or anything would still be in any way relevant these days. So be prepared to do something that you love. But don't ever imagine that it's going to be something someday and you won't get your heart broken. Sure, sure. Um, good, quest good question, Pat. Uh, did Into Another gain a whole new fan base from Bold Underdog or, or did a lot of hardcore fans come along for the ride as I did? Uh, I, it was kind of a double-edged sword because we had a yeah. built-in crowd to some degree. But that crowd yeah. also killed us in a lot of ways because we – we were looked at and I remember a lot of those initial tours, like people saying, Oh, you guys are just sellouts. How do you feel being a bunch of sellouts? And, you know, we, we would literally have uh, stuff happen to us. Like I remember playing a show up in Sacramento with, with rancid before, just before they broke. And, uh, we had the punk rock kids in, in Sacramento writing cock rock sellouts in the dirt on our van. And it's like, man, we got nothing, man. Like, you know, and it's amazing. Cause I just think it's like, there was a mentality that that just considered maybe the type of music we were playing uh, that or the place we came from. It should be this particular thing. And me and Richie wanted to break from that. So I didn't really care, except I wanted people to open their eyes to what we were doing. And I think that evolved over time. But it, again, like we also got a lot from being part of that scene. We got some great people that would come to yeah. see us and people who would be open to what we were playing and a lot of people that joined us from where we came from so again it was it was a definitely a, a double-edged sword with this whole situation yeah it, it it was a interesting time in the music business too there was a, a you know uh the music i mean that era the music the the music business infrastructure was really in full in full effect you know back yeah. then you, you know yeah. as opposed you know uh, i mean eventually it, it's all changed but that i think back on that era and there was just so many bands getting demo deals and deals and this yeah. and that and, and yeah. a, a, you know a label spending you know half a million dollars on a band and a record never came out and all that kind of shit. You know, Strange so, frenzy time, man, for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah. thank you, Pat. Thanks for for, for being yeah. there. Stuff. It's cool. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, good question. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, what John's asking here. Hey Drew, remember Josh Richmond coming to hang out at Into Another Shows? What happened to him? Oh my God, that's amazing! Yeah, uh, Richmond is a character from LA, a good friend of Richie's, and uh, ah. yeah, 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 he was uh, he was a real LA character, man. And I haven't seen him in in, in a little bit. I'm sure Richie still probably uh, is in touch with him, but that's that's a Richie question for sure. But I do remember, okay. man, we uh, we stayed with Josh and and uh, some 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 good people out there in LA a lot when we were there. Got it. Um, this is good. This, this kind of goes into the gear thing. W what brand of drumsticks, uh, what kind of drumsticks do you use? Yeah, I like uh, Vic Firth. I, I use Vic Firth 5B wood tip. Um, I have for a while. I think they're, to me, they're just like the most consistent drumsticks. They don't, they don't shatter on me. They, you know, they'll, they taper nicely and mm -hmm. it's a good, Vic Firth's my brand for sure. Sure. That, that makes sense. Uh, winning team asks, I remember there was a rumor about a new bold record when the reunions happened. Was there ever anything new recorded were you a part of this yes uh i guess if you're talking about the reunions later i don't know which ones he's referring to exactly the Reds, but, i would think the red the the there was an earlier one in 2000s where they played that last cv show but the, after the rev stuff me and me and tom and, and matt kind of tried to go in and, and work on uh on material and maybe me and tom had had done some material on the side and matt had some stuff but it just was one of those situations where I feel like the the relationships uh, in the band were just are just too fragile. It wasn't the it didn't it just didn't work out. I think there was a 
you know, you grow up together and you're going to get sometimes like a lot of, uh, a lot of soap opera shit that happens. And unfortunately, like, um, you, you know, you, you, you grow up together. There's a lot of infighting and a lot of bad with the good. So we weren't able to really pull through that. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly understand that. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. You know, it, it's sort of like, what I mentioned, uh, what I mentioned about my relationship with the biohazard guys, right? They're like my old Camp Delaware friends. Like, there's no boundaries. You know, it's go. merciless. It's merciless. Right. And on. sometimes it's very frustrating because, yeah. you know, I, I I would appreciate a professional relationship once in a while, mm -hmm. but it doesn't exist. It's like you're you're dealing with you know you know like kids you grew up with. You it, know? Exactly it's, my point. Yeah, hundred yeah, yeah. percent. And I think those type of relationships. You know, the, you try to you try to deal with them with a certain amount of like uh, a, a certain way, whereas things that are brand new are, are yeah. just easier out of the gate. But uh, yeah, it comes with a lot of baggage sometimes, man, as you as you just said, you know, and, yeah. and trying to work around that could be great. It could be very frustrating, too. Here's just just in in sort of as we head down the home stretch, mm -hmm. just looking uh, at a couple of the photos and like this one, this one really caught my eye. I mean. Obviously, this is this is uh, anthrax, right? Yes. And I, I personally never made it to the anthrax, being being like a New York City guy. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it didn't. It, it, there was nothing calling me there when I would go to. You, you know, I was like, I lived in Manhattan at the time. So, right. but yeah. but everything I see this way it just seems like it was an inc for a while there it was an incredible um, uh, scene going on there. Could you just give us any perspective on it? Yeah, I think that first of all, that guy without the shirt—that's the—that's that's Zulu. That's the one with the Colombian roots. Just giving ah, him a shout out. Um, there you go. So, uh, yeah, the good thing about the being located where we were, and I said before, is that we were adjacent to a lot of really fantastic scenes. New York was, you know, obviously booming, but we could go to Connecticut too. And they, from day one, this is the Anthrax, the second Anthrax, the one that was Norwalk. Like, Norwalk yeah, is that the right? original yeah. one was in Stanford that always got busted yeah. by the cops. <laughs> we were trying to see Black Flag there that was shut down. Like right, you know, right. Like, but they had incredible shows and they were always packed, man. I mean, like I said, our first show was Descendant, second show was with Seven Seconds um, and on down the line. And we was just always had a great scene because it was close to New Haven as well. And uh, the New Haven, I, I like that whole New Haven scene. And um, you just get a lot of young kids too at the new Anthrax um, in Norwalk. I think there was a whole generation that came up feeling maybe a little safer um, about going yeah. to shows. And sure. so we were getting a lot of kids in that in that world that all of a sudden, as we were growing up, that were more exposed to hardcore and and were like, oh, I, 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 there was a place I could go see this. And they didn't want to go down to the city or they didn't know anybody down there. They go to like, you know, they started going to clubs like the Anthrax. This was right. as the scene was building. Like we take for granted today that just hardcore is, is worldwide mm -hmm. and huge. But you really had to seek out some of these places, man. It wasn't easy, like trying to do these tours and you had to find these pockets that, you know, can go be with a bunch of cool kids on a scene yeah here's a here's an just i randomly just uh out of really? the archive grabbed this uh yeah this, this anthrax flyer Imagine and uh in the old one the perry yeah, street. yeah. Uh, uh perry street perry. yeah no this is norwalk perry, perry street yeah it is okay so yeah I, I mean, it says no booze chum <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's amazing yeah i'm not surprised they didn't have uh they didn't have any licenses for that shit i mean the first one was like a basement like like much like you walk into this room, they had a little hang room, and then you walk downstairs. They had a little cooler in the back with some Coca Cola and some shirts for sale. Jolt. And that's what that's what amazing, Sammy man. said. They had Jolt. They yeah, had yeah, yeah. Jolt, jolt Cola. They yeah, had. Jolt Cola. That's that's crazy. Twice the caffeine, twice the sugar. <laughs> I, you know, if I drank something like that now, I'd I'd like I'd have a fucking I'd I'd like have a cardiac right. arrest. I know, me too, um, man. I can't even yeah, I don't fuck, I don't to fuck with it. that shit. Right. Um, here's one from CB's, uh, once again, uh, great, great CB shot, yeah. you know? Yeah, that, that was thing. the, uh, that was definitely the, the, the best place to play, man. I, I was in yeah. love with that sound system for many years. Um, and I think I, you know, we had fantastic shows within to another there as well. I mean, it was just, you know, we, uh, it was like home. Yeah. Right. Like home. right. And, Absolutely. uh, I don't, I, I should get free. Free uh, clothes from Barbados <laughs> for that home. You know, I you know, um, 
it's interesting that history. I was I, I was talking to Cheetah Chrome at, right. at some point. He's in the Alago film and all that when I was interviewing him and just you know, I was sort of like ragging on John Varvey. Yeah, it's fucked up, you know, what what you know, and his take on it really sort of um put things in perspective for me. Mm-hmm. He said, you know what? It could have been a fucking bank. At least at I least that. Yeah. At, at, yeah, at least he pays homage to sort of the history. Yeah. He said, it could have been a fucking bank and it would have been wiped clean off the sure. face of the earth. And that really changed, you know, wow. Yeah, yeah for real, man. That's a great, it's yeah. a really good point. It could have been a CBS, right? I yeah, mean, right. <laughs> and, and he did, yeah. And he, you know, he had, you know, uh, throughout the course of having that shop, I played there uh, yeah. for, for certain events. They had great, oh, yeah? food, they had great photo exhibits. Yeah. It really, you know, again, um, at least they did honor it. Yes, yeah. they weren't keeping CVs one way or another. So at least, it, yeah, at least it wasn't a pharmacy, and it yeah. wasn't a bank. Thank, thank God, right? Yeah, right. That's um, one small favor. Yeah. So hey, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, it, 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 it was great. Um, I knew it was going to be great. Um, anybody you want to thank? Anybody you want to shout out? Uh, listen, thank you, Drew, as well, man. I had a great time and uh, a great time talking today. Um, the only thing I would, I should shout out to my my boys in the band, the Judas Knife, Chris Enriquez, Joe Grillo, and uh, Justin Williams. I, I did a record during COVID called uh, uh, "Death Is the Thing with Feathers." Um, band is Judas Knife. It was recorded uh, just me and, and, and Joe. Came out on Translation Lost, and uh, that's the that's pretty like. As much as we talked about today, I really that's a new record for me, and and I really love that record as well. So, um, props to those guys also, and uh, thank you for listening to all to my blather today. Appreciate <laughs> it, <laughs> and the crossovers. Yeah, it was great. It was great. True Drew and the crossovers. Yeah, Legion of United and Strong. Um, <laughs> I'll uh, let's keep in touch, Absolutely. and uh, maybe I'll bump I'll bump into you in Astoria. But uh, I'm I'm gonna reach out at some point. Let me let me square away what's happening with with. Uh, with Jesse and, and the Bowery Electric, and we, we must have you guys come down. You have to come down and be a part of the family, man. That would be fantastic, Drew. Be well, man. All right. Man. Thank you, buddy. I'll talk to you okay. soon. Thank you. All right. Good night. Nah. You happy now? You happy? Great show. What can I tell you? Yes. Thank you, Linz. Uh, yeah. Great, great guy. I knew it was going to be a great show. I, I really did. Um, I, I, it just in my interactions with him and 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 doing doing you know doing my homework, you know, um, I just got had a real good grasp of of a lot of the stuff uh, of the band. We want Dana back. I know it's it's tough. I told him that he was bitching about how you know the whole thing. I said people loved you, bro. They want you back. But it, it's, a, I don't know if I can handle it again. Uh, Sean McNally, Boston represent. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, he was great. Great guy. Great guy. Hey, John, how are you, buddy? Good to see you. Um, yeah, Pat, he was great. He was great. Um, hey, you know, get your shoes and socks on uh, for this one, man. This is going to be, this is going to be interesting. This is a band that is just blowing up right now. If you know anything that's going on, you know, in, in heavy and hard, you know, hardcore punk or oyish music, this is a band that's blowing up. I'm excited to uh, to have him come on. You know what? In in, in the sake of uh, superstition, uh, I just want to handle this. Uh, I didn't get a chance to read this off. We are New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. We are sponsored by blah, 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 and Mad Vintage. Mad Vintage buys, sells, and collects band shirts, primarily hardcore. The DIY operation was started and it is operated by a hardcore kid who just loves collecting and eventually got into vintage clothing, specifically the realm of vintage band shirts. They are always looking to buy out collections to either keep, sell, or trade. New shirts added daily at www.madvintage.com and posted on Instagram. Dig deep into that closet of crap. Reach out to them. Get some dough for yourself. Help me help you. Mad Vintage. Last but not least, on today's extravaganza. 126 Hardcore Clothing is a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise, my friend. They are about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for for fresh perspectives 
while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your weak-ass clothing game at www.126clothing.com. All right? Is everybody okay? I hope so. Fantastic show. Uh, yeah, Dana for the 500 show. Is that right? <laughs> oh, God. I, I saw that coming. I, I, I did. I saw that coming. It was... It's like getting ready to get hit by a truck. I, I, I like, I saw it coming, you know? Um, no, no, nobody from blood for blood's been, well, sort of, uh, Billy G Billy from biohazard played in blood for blood. He was on the show, but yeah, <laughs> Dana for 500. Whew. He's a loose cannon, man. Um, so, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Drew. Pure New York hardcore synchronicity as always. Yeah. That's why I get the big bucks, man. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, hopefully, I'll see you on Wednesday. If not, I hope to see you if you are out on the West Coast. Hope to see – well, actually, be better yet, hope to see you tomorrow on the walking tour. If not, hopefully, I'll see you on Wednesday. And if not, if not then hopefully, we'll see you for the shows out in California. This was the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, often imitated, never duplicated. Till then, till next time, do good things and good things will come to you.